Hello, everyone. Welcome to our live stream, Challenging Dr. Chafee's Carnivore Diet. I'm excited. I'm fired up for this one. So uh, Dr. Chafee should be jumping on here with us in just a minute. Today, we're tackling fears and arguments and reasons why you were scared to start the carnivore diet. Um, for example, I've often heard my entire life that vegetables are vital. You got to have your vegetables. Breakfast is the most important meal of the day. If you eat too much meat, it's going to clog your arteries. It's going to kill you. Lots of scary stuff we've been told our entire lives and lots of things that caused me to, to pause when starting carnivore diet. It's a scary, it's a scary thing. Doing carnivore, you have to be pretty brave because you're, you're basically going up against uh, everything you've ever been told. And a lot of times that fear comes from misunderstanding or not having the facts or the truth. So the purpose of this video, and uh, Dr. Chafee and I have done a couple of videos like this now, it's been a lot of fun. Purpose of these videos is to break down the, those myths, answer the tough questions, overcome the fear, looking at the facts, trying to get to the truth. So um, the other thing I would suggest as well is don't just listen to us and don't just do this. Do your own research. There's so much great information out there. Uh, check out Dr. Chafee's channel for sure. If you haven't subscribed uh, to that yet, you certainly should. He's got so many great uh, videos on carnivore diet. One of, uh, one of his best, I'd really suggest, especially if you're new to carnivore and this is your first entry into it, is uh, his video. It's titled Carnivore for Beginners, How to Start a Carnivore Diet with Tips and Tricks. It's an excellent video. It has nearly half a million views. And this is just free information. So I always encourage people. So many people have been commenting on my YouTube videos lately. And they're saying, uh, I'm going to start carnivore right now. I'm going to go buy a steak right now. And I'm like, no, don't do that. You have to know your why for starting carnivore. And it has to be a powerful why. And then you have to know your how. How are you going to do it? It's not just going out and buying some ground beef and steaks and eating it. There's certain things that you have to account for and you got to, you got to do it right. And you got to understand it and you got to make the decision for yourself before you just jump on and do it. And it's free information at our fingertips. I wish I had the resources um, that are available now 20 years ago. I, I wish I had Dr. Chafee's videos 20 years ago. It would have changed my life forever. So uh, strongly encourage everyone to, to check out Dr. Chafee's channel. I've got a, it's, it's listed in the description below and uh, it's down there on the bottom of the screen as well. And so uh, whew, I'm excited for this. I'm fired up. We did a couple other videos in this series. So if you guys haven't watched those yet, check it out. And um, Dr. Chafee should be joining us here any second. Now, I just want to give a huge shout out to him. He is such a generous person. We need more doctors like Dr. Chafee. We have to elevate Dr. Chafee's message, Dr. Barry's message, Dr. Baker's message, or we're never going to have more doctors like them. He's been, a lot of you uh, have probably heard of my, my new friend, Bill, and his story. It's just amazing. 700 pounds from Alaska. He's been doing carnivore. Today's his day 11. He's thriving. You can already see some of his face changing. This, if you guys haven't heard this story, you got to check out my channel and see. I did a whole video, and then you got to go check out Bill's channel. He he couldn't afford meat, and uh, he lives in Alaska, and he's seven hundred pounds. He hasn't left his house in four years, and he's he's on carnivore for eleven days now. And the goal is to get him in our carnivore diet documentary we're putting together. That's on the bottom of the screen. We need all the help we can get with that. So this is a crowdfunded documentary, and. I may be flying out to see Bill shortly. I'm going to decide here in the next day or two. So um, more to come on that very soon. But I was just going to say, uh, there's Dr. Chafee now. Dr. Chafee, uh, I'm just, uh, I was telling people a quick update about Bill. And I was nice. telling people how important it is that we elevate people like Dr. Chafee. Because I wish there were doctors like you. I, I, keep, I keep showing people this. I got it on my desk here. But. All of these doctors failed me, and I've had so many things that are 100 times better on carnivore diet. I just wish I found it earlier. So it's really important mm -hmm. that we give credit where due. And um, I, I just I, I wanted to thank you, Dr. Chafin, for being so generous with your time and no, you're fine. Help, helping with Bill, too. So this thing with Bill, I was just telling everyone, give him a quick update. 
Dr. Chafee, he's on day 11 right now. He's just doing awesome. It's nice. 700 pounds, and he's going to be in the carnivore diet movie. Um, and I'm thinking about maybe flying out there in the next day or two. So um, it's, but you were so generous and you were like, if he needs any help, just I'll, I'll have a private phone call with him and help him. And I, I really appreciate yeah. that. And Bill really appreciates it. And it's, it's awesome what you're doing. So I was just telling everybody, go to Dr. Chafee's channel, subscribe. We have to elevate doctors like Dr. Chafee. We need more doctors in the world like this. Uh, so Dr. Chafee, I kind of went through the intro and uh, mm -hmm. basically there's a lot of scary stuff out there that stops people from starting carnivore. But when you get to the facts of it, you can get over the fear and then start it. And that's kind of the purpose of this video. Dr. Chafee and I have done a couple of videos like this. So Dr. Chafee, I mean, maybe just to kick things off, if you wouldn't mind, could you introduce yourself? Uh, yeah. So, so my name is Dr. Anthony Chafee. I'm an American physician. I work in Australia at the moment, uh, special, um, you know, so I'm in a, a, a residency for neurosurgery. I also have a private practice in functional medicine and metabolic health. And I've just done a lot of research into diet and nutrition, how that affects health and chronic disease. And I've found that that is one of the best tools that I've found to, to help my patients get better and not, not need surgery in the future and not need a whole bunch of medications now. Awesome. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, I'll, I'll just do myself here real quick. So my name's Carrie. I've been carnivore for 134 days. Today's day 46 on the lion diet. Carnivore has completely changed my life forever. I'm two pounds shy of being down a hundred pounds since my heaviest. Um, I overcame depression, anxiety, IBS. I, I would stop breathing about 400 times throughout the night. I had a CPAP machine strapped around my face every night just to breathe because of the food I was eating. And all of that's gone now. For the first time in my life, I just I feel like a natural human being, like a human should feel. And I guess the other big thing about me is I'm on a mission right now. It's my new purpose and goal in life is to share examples of carnivore diet. So we're putting together the carnivore diet documentary. I talked about Bill earlier. He's going to be in there. And after he's been stuck in his house for four years. And if the, the goal is to show Bill uh, right now, I'm actually probably going to be flying out there in the next couple of days to start filming with him. So it's really exciting. Uh, but we need more participants, too. So if you're interested in sharing your carnivore example, it's not just obesity, it's diabetes, mental health issues, um, aging, women's health, all of those things. We want to share those examples over the course of one year um, on the carnivore diet. We're not telling people, hey, you should do the carnivore diet or you should eat this way. It's just look at all these examples, use your own two eyes and then decide what, what you want to do. And um, I think it's so important to share all of these examples. It's what inspired me to get started on carnivore diet. So uh, yeah, with that said, should we jump right into some of these questions? I have, um, we've, we've done these videos before, Dr. Chafee and I have. So uh, check some of those out. Go to Dr. Chafee's channel and, and check some of the past ones out. They're, they're so good. You just, you were knocking them out of the park. And we have more questions we didn't get to last time that people have submitted. And I keep saying questions. They're more so arguments against carnivore diet. I want to start carnivore diet, but I'm scared because it's going to clog my arteries. I'm going to die of a heart attack or whatever the reason may be. So we have some of those here. But if you guys have any of your own, please leave them in the comments. If you have a question, you can put a little cue in front of it. And I was just saying earlier, if you have a fear, a carnivore fear, maybe put a big F in front of it and then we'll be able to catch it quickly. But we've got some right here. So what do you say, Dr. Chafee? Should we just jump into some of these? Yeah, sounds good. All right, here's one. And now all most of these are new. We've covered some really good ones before. This one I wanted to cover, though, because a lot of times there's new people on here. We've touched on a little bit of this before. So per Cleveland Clinic, the carnivore diet's high saturated fat content raises LDL cholesterol, something a lot of people were worried about. Increasing heart disease risk. It's, it's uh, low in essential nutrients and can cause health issues long term. Yeah. Well, it's, fu it's funny that they say it's low in essential nutrients. I, I wonder which ones, you know, they're talking about is that, is that the arsenic or the cyanide or the, you know, sulfurophane and you know, what's with the oxalates and things like that. Um, no, you're, you're not missing anything. Absolutely not anything. You know, how do we know this? Because the Inuit exist, right? So they eat just meat and they don't have anything else. You know, people say that, well, the Maasai, they eat this and the other, and you, know, you go there and actually they, you know, they don't, you know, there are, there are some who do and the, the ones eat, you know, living traditionally, they really don't eat it, it, really any plant material. Um, and then different, you know, the Nanette and uh, other populations, the Australian Aboriginals and their, their native, uh, you know, sort of uh, 
civilization, they, they really just ate meat and they may have eaten plants when they had to. And certainly when they were introduced uh, by, uh, you know, Westerners, but uh, left to their own devices, they really weren't eating meat unless they were really weren't eating plants unless they had to. So there, there's nothing that you're missing. We know that because there are people that only eat meat throughout their entire life. We have entire civilizations and cultures that only eat meat throughout their entire existence, generation after generation, and they are actually extraordinarily healthy, lean, strong, fit individuals, great microbiome. Uh, they also don't get heart disease. That That is the disease of the West. That was used to be called the disease of the West. Now it's just getting older. Now everyone gets heart disease, and we, we don't think about that. We don't think about the fact that the first heart, the first heart attack, a uh, person who died of a heart attack uh, and proven on autopsy to have done so was in around 1910 in America. We don't look at that. We don't, and we don't realize that then they, they thought, no, you, you got it wrong. You saw something, you, know, you, you didn't see uh, what you said you did. That's a lie. Uh, 10 years later, they started having more and more of these people dying from this weird thing that they'd never seen before. And they've been doing autopsies for hundreds and hundreds of years, thousands of years, really. And yet this is the first time they've seen that. And uh, 10 years after that, it's the number one killer in America. Why is that? You know, it came out of nowhere. Um, so it certainly wasn't the meat we were eating because we're actually eating more meat in the 1800s than we were in the 1900s. And certainly in the, in the 1920s and 30s when, when those levels spiked up, that was actually a trough. We're eating the least amount of meat uh, in the 20s and 30s in America that we'd eaten in 200 years, right? And so obviously that's not the case. Saturated fat. Well, Cleveland Clinic is great. It's, it's a it's a wonderful institution, but you know they don't they don't get everything right every time. And the Journal of the American College of Cardiology published in 2020 um, a massive uh, literature review looking at all the best studies and meta analyses and and the you know randomized controlled trials and all these different sorts of things. And they found absolutely no connection, not even an association, weak or otherwise, between increased saturated fat intake and heart disease. Now, it, it may or may not increase LDL. It actually doesn't in many people. However, it does not increase your risk of heart disease. It, it's not even associated with an increased risk of heart disease. That is published in the top cardiology journal on earth. And in fact, some of these authors had been authors on other publications saying saturated fat's bad. You got to watch out for it. This is where they're mea culpa saying, hey, you know, I, you know, we got it wrong. And we're sorry. This is what we, this is what we think now. And this is what the evidence shows. So in fact, they found an inverse relationship between saturated fat intake and stroke. So the more saturated fat people eat, the less strokes they have. So lower your stroke risk. The less saturated fat you eat, the higher your stroke risk, the more people were having strokes. And there was a study with LDL, well, was tons of studies with LDL in the last decade showing literally the opposite of LDL being uh, a, heart, a heart disease risk. In fact, they found some that found it was protective and they found one, one study looked at over 11 million people, one of the largest studies that's ever been performed looking at LDL cholesterol, not even differentiating out. There's over hundred different kinds of LDL cholesterol, first of all, and it, it's important to know which, which kind you have. If you have the large, buoyant, healthy LDL cholesterol, you really, it's not even associated with uh, heart disease risk. Right, not really, and um, and they found that even the all the different particulate sizes that that aren't uh, you know as as good for you as the large buoyant ones didn't matter. Just LDL in general, that higher LDL cholesterol equated to lower all cause mortality. Right, so you lived longer, you died less often if you had higher cholesterol. Any higher uh, LDL cholesterol, right? So, so your LDLC was higher, you lived longer on average for 11 million people, one of the largest studies that's ever been done. And you go back to the original studies, looking at, at uh, LDL cholesterol, total cholesterol and heart disease. And in fact, these were fraudulent. So, so the saturated fat was never a problem. Cholesterol was never a problem. Uh, cholesterol is very important. And uh, it's, it's ubiquitous. Every single one of our cells is made out of cholesterol. Our hormones are made out of cholesterol. Our brain is 20% cholesterol. Bile is made out of cholesterol. So many things are uh, reliant on cholesterol. And also LDL is, is not cholesterol. It's a transport molecule. So you're talking about LDLC, LDLP, all these different sorts of things. However, these associations they had with total cholesterol and LDL and uh, C and so forth, they were fraudulent. 
These were bought and paid for by the sugar companies. We know now the Journal of the American Medical Association published in 2016 actual internal memos from the sugar companies detailing how they paid off three Harvard professors to falsify data and publish fraudulent studies to make it appear as if cholesterol caused heart disease when it was really sugar and to exonerate sugar and say that it was safe when there were studies out there saying that actually there's a strong association with increased sugar consumption and heart disease. Also a very strong association, very strong association between uh, seed oils, you know, like cooking oil, canola oil, sunflower oil, soybean oil, things like that, and heart disease. And in fact, it's probably, probably a better relationship. I think they're both both uh, implicated, but, um, uh, but seed oils are, are very bad. And so they paid off a number of professors. One of those professors from Harvard was named head of the USDA, and it was he who authored, authored and published the 1977 USDA declaration saying that cholesterol caused heart disease, saturated in fact increases cholesterol, stop eating both of them, and, and this changed the world. And since the 1970s, 1977, in America, we reduced red meat consumption by over 33%, reduced uh, fat and cholesterol uh, intake by about the same, increased fruits and vegetables by 30, 40% respectively, increased grains and uh, increased high fructose corn syrup by over three times, increased seed oils by over three times. And what happened? Well, a lot of things happened. People got fatter, sicker, more di chronic diseases, all these sorts of things, but heart disease rates tripled. Now you'll have dishonest people, usually in vegan cohort that are trying to, to push their narrative and agenda. And they'll say, no, 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 actually, you know, um, heart disease deaths have gone down. It peaked in the 1960s and seventies, and then it started coming down just, just perfectly coincided with uh, our reduction in cholesterol. So, you know, it, you know, that's better. What did they say? What did we say? We said three times as much heart disease, right? They said, heart disease, deaths from heart disease, mortality rate of heart disease peaked in the 1960s and 70s and then went down. Okay. So they are trying to distract you. They are trying to, they are talking about something else and they're trying to pretend that they're talking about what you're talking about. So yes, deaths have gone down. What has gone up? Cardi, you know, cardiothoracic surgery has gotten a lot better. You quadruple bypass is a lot easier now. We don't die as often. We can do stents endovascular treatment, go in, see someone who's getting, you know, angina or angina, depending on where you are. And that goes up, goes up the, the artery and you just sort of open up those, those vessels before you ever have a heart attack, all these sorts of things. If you do have a heart attack, then go in, take out the clot, open up the, the area, same with strokes in the brain, things like that. And so our interventions have gotten a lot better. Also, smoking rates have come down dramatically, which is a massive, 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 uh, you know, boon for, Heart, uh, for, for people who don't want to develop heart disease or, or die from heart disease. So the prevalence and incidence have gone up. So the numbers of people with heart disease has gone up, is going up around the world and in America. It's just the death rate hasn't you know, gone up. It's sort of gone down because of our interventions and because of we, we've uh, stopped smoking. But the amount of people that are getting their first heart attacks is going up, has been going up since then. And so you can't say that cholesterol directly causes only thing there and smoking, obviously, that cholesterol causes heart disease when you reduce cholesterol and heart disease rates triple. If anything, you can say that it's protective. And in fact, that's actually what a lot of their studies at the time showed, that they doctored the evidence and they misreported them. The Framingham study is one of the most famous studies in cardiology. I was taught this in uh, my first year of medical school. It was just the study that just proved the case, right? And it followed, you know, something like 76,000 people over, you know, a few decades, and they made a lot of different associations with, uh, with their health and all the different things that they were doing. One thing that was taught to me was that when they had um, higher levels of cholesterol, higher levels of cardiovascular uh, death, right? So like strokes, heart attacks, things like that, right? Okay, pretty good. Correlation is not causation, but you got 76,000 people. It's a lot of people goes up, that goes up. Okay. Seems pretty good. People don't tend to ask questions after that, even though that's very weak evidence. Correlation cannot show causation, right? But the problem is, is that that was actually a misrepresentation. That was the American Heart Association, which again was was uh, compromised by the sugar industry. They had they had people that they had paid off, you know, at the, at the heads of of the American Heart Association at its inception that uh, were pushing their agenda, and they actually misrepresented 
the the Framingham study. So the Framingham study actually showed that as you lowered your cholesterol, cardiovascular death rate went up. Exactly the opposite. So in fact, higher cholesterol protected people from heart attacks and strokes, right? And so you know that's that's my answer. Saturated fat. 100% does not cause heart disease, does not contribute to heart disease, and uh, it, and LDL doesn't either. It just doesn't. You know, I mean, maybe you can look at certain patterns of your different, you know, LDL particulates and see if you have a greater or reduced risk of developing heart disease. That does not mean that those molecules are causing the disease. It just means that they're being used in the process or they're being damaged. And this is, again, the smoke and not the fire right? They're being damaged. Other things are being damaged. The whole body is being damaged and you're getting heart disease and you're blaming it on, you know, this little guy over here, which, which is not borne out by, by the data. I don't think, you know, even if you have the, the bad pattern of LDL, like a pattern B LDL, you're having all these small dense, um, you know, LDL, uh, C molecules running around, which have a stronger association with heart disease. It's, it's a 70% increase risk of heart disease, right? So it's 1.7 X. 1.7 times increased risk of developing heart disease. Very scary, 70%, right? Well, metabolic syndrome increases your risk by 600%, so 6x. And diabetes increases your risk by 1,000%, 10x, right? Smoking is about the same. So that 1.7x on a SDLEL, I just really, I just, I'm not getting out of bed for that, you know? And the fact of the matter is you're not going to have SDLDL if you're eating a, a natural appropriate carnivore diet and you're not eating carbs, you're not eating seed oils, you're not drinking alcohol, you're, you're not going to have that, you know? So saturated fat does not increase SDLDL and statins don't decrease SDLDL. They stop your body from making the large buoyant LDL, which are the good ones. So you're reducing the LDL that are good for you and you're preserving all the ones that are bad for you because th those don't actually change. So it's not actually the change in your cholesterol that, that makes statins helpful. How helpful are they? If you've had a heart attack and you go on statins for at least five years, you'll increase your life expectancy on average by five days, not years, not months, days, right? And, uh, and you have a lot of side effects, you have a lot of costs. And uh, you know, there's a study that actually showed that certain um, uh, statins like Lipitor can cross the blood brain barrier and they can, uh, actually stop your brain cells from making cholesterol, which they need to do. 20% of your brain is made out of cholesterol thereabouts. Your axons are myelinated with a lot of cholesterol, right? And so you can get demyelination. You can actually get atrophy of your brain. And you have all these patients with Alzheimer's who are on these statins. They said, okay, why don't we take the, you off the statins? Wouldn't you know in six weeks, they didn't have Alzheimer's anymore. Funny enough. And then they put them back on the statins and six weeks later, they had Alzheimer's again, right? Mm. So this is causing harm and it's giving you five days, right? Five days in a nursing home dribbling. Thank you, I'll, I'll go without. And if you haven't had a heart attack, it increases it by three days, right? So not much bang for your buck. And, and there's definitely a lot that could be uh, a problematic with it as well. So, um, you know, I, and I don't know when the, the Cleveland Clinic said that. I don't know if they've, they've changed their mind since then, but saturated fat is simply not uh, the, the problem that, that people thought it was. And that was a long answer to that, but I think that's probably one of the major ones that people have. Yeah. And it's just absolutely just, just absolutely just hammer the nail in the coffin on that one and just let that die and go away. I, I just want to add something too. I didn't mention this before. Dr. Chafee hasn't seen these questions in advance and you're not using a teleprompter, right? No. <laughs> so this, this is another, another thing. I always tell people, use your own two eyes and observe these things. Like all of the, that answer Dr. Chafee just gave, that's the carnivore brain at work, right? Do you think Dr. Chafee before this, you would have been able to rattle off just your, your stats and figures and statistics and studies and just like that, like, I'm finding myself on carnivore. I'm able to just riff. I did a video yesterday for like 40 minutes where I could never do that before. It's something kind of, <laughs> sorry, I'm getting off track here, but something interesting with carnivore. The other thing you it said that, that's so interesting. I heard Dr. Philip Lavadia talk about that too. The metabolic health. Why doesn't anybody mm. talk about metabolic health? Everyone that knows I'm doing carnivore, I want to see your LDL. You're going to die of a heart attack. Nobody talks about metabolic health. And it's like you said, six times more likely to have heart disease if you have poor metabolic health. And you look around mm. the world right now, 
everybody seems to have poor metabolic health and nobody's worried about it. And gee, I wonder why, because if you're worried about metabolic health, that's less sugar and junk food you're going to be eating. And like we've said before, if you want to sell an incredible amount of sugar, just demonize meat and get everybody scared about LDL. And if you're not eating meat, the only thing yeah. left is to go back to the sugar and the junk food and the carbs. Well, and, and the thing is, too, is that if, if you are eating the junk food and you're getting sick and uh, then you need the medicine. Right. So they're all they're all tied up. They're all invested in each other. So the food companies are invested heavily in the pharmaceuticals. The pharmaceutical companies are invested heavily in the food companies. And in some cases, like Kellogg's, Kellogg's actually makes diabetes medication. So they they make frosted, you know, cornflakes and things like that. And then they sell that to you, gives you diabetes, and then they sell you the medication for it. You know, I mean, that, that I mean, that's you know, that, that, that that's knowledge of forethought. They, they know what's happening. They're selling you a product that causes the disease, which now they're selling you the treatment for. I, I think that's honestly diabolical. I think that's pure evil that you're, you're doing something that causes disease and you're profiting from it. You know, you're profiting from people eating your product, which is, which is harming them. And then you're like, yeah, well, I'll just sell, sell them this other thing too. You know, that was what, um, someone said that they, um, they heard, uh, someone at a, at a, you know, drug company exec said, you know, my favorite you know, drug is, and they were thinking, they were like, oh, it's going to be this thing that cures, you know, childhood leukemia and all these sorts of things. I was like, oh, you know, what is it? And it's just like, my favorite drugs are the ones that cause problems that need more drugs. Those are my favorite drugs. And, um, I think if I was in the room with them, I'd probably, you know, knock the guy out and uh, feel pretty good about it, you know? And, and, you know, but, um, that, that I think is truly sick, you know, and, and I think it was, was it Goldman Sachs or something like that. One of the investment companies, uh, if it wasn't them, I apologize, but you know, there was, a, there was an investment company. I think it was Goldman Sachs that someone, someone leaked a picture from one of their, their meetings that says, you know, is it really a good business model to cure diseases? Right. Implying that, you know, shouldn't, shouldn't we just perpetuate a chronic state that we can sell someone the, the treatment for the symptom, something that you, you can treat the symptom for, 60 years and put them on blood pressure medication, diabetes medication, you know, statins and things like that for 60 years and just, you know, profit on them their whole life until they die young, sick and, and miserable. You know, I, I think that, that that's truly sick. I mean, people, people have lost their humanity, you know, and, and I don't think that they, I honestly think these people should be jailed. Like if you're knowingly doing something like that, you, you got to go, like you have to go. <laughs> Like that, that is not okay. You know, you, you are causing harm and you're profiting from it. Like you don't get to do that. Right. Wow. All right. Here's another question or concern. I'm scared to start carnivore because I've heard many say red meat is associated with an increased risk of colon and rectum cancer and evidence also suggests it's associated with some other cancers. Mm. So the university of Washington uh, published last year, a massive, review looking at, at hundreds of different studies that that asked that question and looked into it and the ones that that suggested that there was a very very weak and tenuous link and again association with uh, red meat meat processed meat whatever and any cancer of any form rectal cancer or otherwise they found that they were extremely flawed studies extremely weak evidence extremely bad studies that they said the, these were lazy studies. This was lazy, it was junk science and that they didn't prove anything. They didn't even show association. When you get rid of the co confounding factors and the biases and things like that, they found no association, no association between meat and any cancers and certainly not unprocessed red meat and cancer. So this is something, this is, this is a problem, again, going back to the processed food companies and the Seventh-day Adventist Church and and uh, and other sorts of things that have a vested interest against meat, not just for plants, but against meat, right? Because the Seventh-day Adventist Church are religiously anti-meat. And in the 1800s, they said that you know meat causes lustful feelings, so uh, meat is a sin. Because lust is a sin, meat is now a sin. And plants help suppress your lustful feelings. They help suppress your hormones and your health. And so your body says you can't procreate. Right. And so that that's what's happening there. Um, but that's what they thought. This was, they thought this was a good thing that you just were depressed and miserable and, uh, and your body wasn't capable of having children. 
Um, and somehow that was holy, even though the Bible tells you to go forth and multiply, you know? And so they founded Sanitarium Foods and Kellogg's Foods and, and the processed food industry was started by them to push this plant-based agenda to stop people and suppress their hormones and make them, uh, you know, less, less active sexually. For some reason that really was important to them, um, to force this on the rest of the world. And the sugar companies and the drug companies and the, uh, you know, other food companies and things like that, they're the ones putting out the majority of the research in nutrition. So just Coca-Cola spends 11 times the amount of money on nutritional research than the NIH. And that's not to say what Nestle and Pepsi and Kellogg's and Sanitarium and the Seventh day Adventists are putting out. So all of these studies, you have to look at where they're coming from. You have to look at who peer reviews them. Quite often it's Loma Linda Medical Center, which is the Seventh day Adventist uh, church's uh, medical center and, and medical school, right? And then you have the, the Adventist studies. Oh, the Adventist studies. Okay, again, you're looking, you're, you're, this, is, this is fruit from the poison vine, right? You're looking at the Adventists. They're doing their own study on their own people with their own numbers and their own interpretations, right? It's never going to be fair. So you look at all these studies, the vast majority of these studies are put out by these people that have vested interests. You cannot trust them. And so the University of Washington was, they were actual scientists, actual doctors who actually wanted to know the truth. They looked at these things and were like, these are crap. These are crap studies. They're horribly designed. They don't show what you're saying they show. And so that they, they just said, absolutely not. So they concluded that. So you can, you can find that um, you can find that study from the University of Washington last year. The reason people really blame, you know, meat and you know processed meat in particular uh, with with being a carcinogen is because the WHO said it was in 2015, right? They said that processed meat was uh, was a carcinogen, you know, caused cancer, and that that uh, red meat probably caused cancer, right? Probably mean okay. So name one thing in red meat that causes cancer, right? There isn't anything, right? However, the WHO actually has a, a, web, a web page dedicated to different natural food toxins. And you're like, oh, okay, so maybe there'll be stuff about meat in there. Not a single thing in meat. Everything's about plants, all the different toxins that are in plants that we eat. And they're toxic in the proportions that we eat them. And you have to detoxify them. You have to prepare them in certain ways or you can die right? So these are very toxic. Not a single line on meat. There was, um, there was a mention of uh, algae, not, not meat, that could get into sea life, right? Shellfish, fish, and things like that, right? And then you could get sick from eating, you know, the, you could eating the algae through, you know, the fish or the, the shellfish that had eaten the algae. But that's not the fish doing that. So they said that that this that uh, processed meat was was the problem, right? Okay, but if if you go from red meat, unprocessed meat, into processed meat, it becomes ca cancerous, carcinogenic. Okay, well, what happened? Did you add more meat to it, and that that made it cancerous all of a sudden? No, they added plants, seasonings, sugar, artificial ingredients, a bunch of preservatives, a bunch of nonsense like that. So if you went from an un not cancerous thing to a cancerous thing, it's the things you added to it that were the problem, right? So it wasn't the meat in the first place, but the WHO, um, you know, it, it, it's even worse than that because they, you know, they looked at these studies and they looked at the flawed studies. They looked at the bad studies that, that pushed what they wanted to, because wanted, wanted to say, because a, a large portion of these people, a controlling portion of this, of this group were vegans, vegetarians, and Seventh-day Adventists or a combination thereof. Right. And so there are other people on those, that panel still in the WHO who were basically railroaded and, you know, couldn't make decisions, couldn't say like, Hey, look, you're, you're throwing out very strong data that show that there's no relationship between meat, red meat and cancer, including very flawed studies that are very weak evidence that are not as good. And yet they, they push your narrative and they kept those in. And so they said that that was uh, one of the, one gentleman said that that was one of the hardest things he's had to go through professionally, seeing them constantly, you know, throw away very, very good studies that showed that there was no connection with, with meat and cancer and bringing in ones that, that uh, were crap. And he said, okay, you guys need to display your biases. 
you need to say that you're vegans and vegetarians and, and seventh day Adventists. They refuse. Right. So of course, this is the this is narrative. You know, this is ideology. This is not science. This is not fact. And so the more people that understand that, the better because you know they, they can only survive. You can only survive a web of lies if people don't know that they're lies. And so the more people that understand that, the better. Meat does not cause cancer, right? The the cancer rates of the Inuit actually very low. It's successively gone up in successive generations and decades as they've been further incorporated into Western society and started eating more Western foods, right? Cancer doesn't exist in the wild. Cancer is a disease of civilization. That was a book title by a professor from Harvard in, in the 1920s called uh, Wilhelmer Stefansson, who people know wrote a book called The Fat of the Land. He lived with the Inuit then called the Eskimo for 12 years, learned their language, learned their culture, just ate meat the whole time. He said, "This I've never felt better in my entire life. And he, and he really started looking into it. And he found that cancer only existed in, you know, more modern civilizations, not in the primitive populations. We do not see cancer in wild animals. We do not see cancer in zoo animals being fed their natural diet. We do see cancers in pets that are given a bunch of grains and plant-based crap that they're not designed to eat. We do see it in zoo animals if they're fed this plant-based crap that they're not designed to eat either. So that's my answer. <laughs> that's another one of these things that, that, that really just do need to die. It's just, it's just, um, it's propaganda. It's ideology. It is not science. Love it. And that's one big thing I've learned on carnivore because my whole life, when I would hear a study, you hear them all the time too. You're inundated with them throughout mm. your whole life on the nightly news. Meat's going to kill you. Like all these, mm. all these studies. I always used to think study science and I never really thought about them. I always, in the back of my head, it's like, well, these are here for my benefit. It's, they're not. Like, you really need to question all of these studies because it's incredibly expensive to do a study. Someone's not going to do it unless there's some sort of bias or some sort of agenda or some sort of pharmaceutical pill that they want to sell, sell at the end of it. Um, it's kind of like on when you're doing carnivore, you got to be a, um, a detective looking at all the ingredients or foods or just only eat meat. <laughs> But you got to really look into things and you got to it's the same thing with those studies. I don't listen to any studies anymore unless you you really look into it. Uh, here's another one. Carnivore diet is way too restrictive. Life is too short to sacrifice ice cream and social outings for a carnivore diet. That'll make me a joyless hermit. <laughs> <laughs> Very seem, specific. You don't seem yeah. like a joyless hermit. I'm not a joyless hermit, but. No, I mean, look, that, I mean, that, that's the same argument as saying, you know, that's too restrictive, not doing meth and heroin all day. I mean, that's ridiculous. You want to live your life like that? I mean, really? You know, you, you want to not do heroin and meth? I mean, have you ever done heroin and meth? You might like it. You know, you might want to do that every day. Same idea, right? You're doing something that is knowingly bad for you, right? Obviously, you know, drugs are, are pretty intense, but, but it, it's illustrating a point. You're doing something that's knowingly bad for you because you want the effect, right? So you want the social experience. You just want to have something nummy like ice cream. Um, you know, that that's sacrificing your health for a momentary joy is not a good idea. And so, you know, we look at people that, that drink to excess or do drugs uh, and we and we and that person would probably be like, that's ridiculous. That that's no way to live. Well, but life is short. Well, you're going to make it a lot shorter. By doing that, and yes, you're gonna you're gonna have fun now, you know, but you're not gonna actually live and and you know a fulfilling life that you could with you know family, career, loved ones, travel, all sorts of interesting things that could engage you for decades. And the same thing is true with, with food, right? You're, you're trading decades of your life. We're not talking about a few years. We're talking about decades. We know genetically, we know as geneticists that chromosomally, we are designed to live 120 years. I was taught that in, in my genetic class 20 years ago, 20 plus years ago now. Jesus Christ, I'm old. <laughs> so, you know, it's, um, you know, that based on the length of our telomeres, right? So we, we, we look at that and you can sort of gauge how long a, a, an animal or a species is supposed to live. We're 120 years. I mean, it's crazy. You go back through historical records, there's, you know, civilizations that, that have said this, you know, the Native Americans, they would often live 120 years. Ah, they're just saying that. Herodotus documented the Ethiopians. They said they lived 120 years, just ate boiled meat, just drank milk and water. 
Ah, must have been lying. But the Persians said they lived 80 years and they ate bread. Well, that's about that's about what we're eating, where we're living. They didn't have a bunch of processed foods. It was just breads and things like that. So, you know, but it was always 120. It was always coming back to that. So what, what does that mean? If you are gen genetically designed to live 120 years, then that means, by definition, that if you just don't mess up, you just stay out of your own way and just don't mess up, that you should live 120 years without doing anything special. It should just happen. It should just happen on its own. So why are we dying in our 60s and 70s? That's literally middle-aged. And that's because we are, are rotting our bodies. We're rotting our brains. We're decaying decades early. We're, we're starting to decay in our 30s and 40s. Oh, you're middle-aged. You're, you're past 20. It's just downhill from there. When was that ever a thing? Right, Benjamin Franklin was was kicking ass in his you know, 60s and 70s, like during the you know the the, the Revolutionary War, and um, you know, and so you know, it, it, you know, Socrates was in his late 70s when they had to kill him. You know, he was so uh, you know so healthy and vig you know and and you know vigorous that like you know he was there you know corrupting the youth of Athens you know in his late 70s, right? So. You know, that's just just not the case. You know, we are designed to live a lot longer and yet we're, we're dying, we're collapsing, our bodies are just decaying and degenerating. Uh, we're getting heart disease in our 30s and 40s. People are dying of heart attacks in their 30s, which is crazy. The first heart attack was in, you know, 1910 or so. And now people are in their 30s, you know, people in their 20s are getting heart disease. Like how the hell is that possible, right? So, you know, this is, this is just a, a major problem. So yes, you can do that and, you know, good luck to you, but I would rather be vigorous and healthy for the next hundred years and people, oh, I don't want to live that long. Oh, that'd be horrible. Where did this come from? Most people say, oh, I want to live forever. I don't want to die. Then you say, okay, Hey, you know, you just eat meat. You can live another hundred years. Oh, I don't want, oof, I wouldn't want that. I wouldn't want to live that long. What the hell? Why are you, why are we talking about this? You just said you wanted to live forever but you don't actually want to live longer. They think that, you know, you're going to age in, in the same pattern that we're aging. Now you get up to 70, 80, people are just like, just decrepit and dying and, and just not doing well health wise. They don't have a very, you know, uh, you know, you know, envious life, you know, sitting at home, not being able to do anything, uh, you know, sitting in a nursing home, playing shuffleboard or something like that. If they can even get out of a chair, and then stacking on another 40 years of that where you're even like getting worse and worse and worse. And you're just sitting there with a blanket and a towel with someone wiping your face. Obviously, you know, that's not a desirable life. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about being hale and hearty, healthy, older adults. And your brain's still working, your body's still working, you being fully independent and active until you just slowly pass away at 135. Thank you. Count me in. I'm happy with that. You know, invest in compound interest right now, you know, just, just, it's a waiting game at that point. You'll be fine. You'll live in a castle in Transylvania somewhere for the next 50, you know, last 50 years of your life. You'll be fine. All right. So, um, you know, it, it depends on what you find restrictive. You know, it's just eating, eating our biologically designed diet. That's restrictive. Well, why not eat, you know, uh, just random plants. Well, why would you? That's not good for you. It's going to be healthy for you. Okay. So that's not food for you. So I don't consider non-meat food because it's not food for our species. Sp food is species specific. So I, I'm not restricting at all. I eat everything that is designed for hu humans to eat, which is any animal basically, or the parts of that animal that aren't, that aren't, you know, poisonous, right? You know, have poison sacks and things like that. And so that's what I eat. I don't limit myself at all. You know, I'm very unrestrictive. You know what is restrictive is type 2 diabetes, heart disease, cancer is very restrictive. Autoimmune disease, multiple sclerosis that will, you know, cripple you, put you in a wheelchair and then kill you. That's pretty restrictive. You know, having to take thousands of dollars of medications a month, that's pretty restrictive. You know, that's going to that's gonna put you out of it. Um, you know, going bankrupt, having to pay for chemo for yourself or a loved one, that's pretty restrictive. Um, taking medications 20 times a day, having massive side effects, GI upsets, and uh, you know, vomiting, being sick all the time. That that's actually pretty damn restrictive. You're not being able to play with your kids is restrictive. Not being able to, you know, uh, you know, be an active member in your relationship, in your in your marriage, not being able to work properly 
being sick, so sick that you, you can't even function, you can't succeed in your job and your career and your profession, being so racked with chronic pain that you can't leave the house without copious amounts of, of medications that, that dope you up so much that you can barely function. That's restrictive. You know, not, not having something nummy every now and then, that, that is the least restrictive thing I've ever heard of in my, in my entire life. Yes. Wow. So true. And they say joyless hermit. I, I'm on carnivore day, <laughs> day, day 134. I have never felt better my entire life, 100 years with no ice cream. Mm. And the, the people that are saying, like you mentioned earlier, oh, who wants to live to 100? They're in the mindset of the standard American diet feeling like garbage every single day. If they felt like you or I feel right now, oh, yeah, take me to 120 yeah. years old, 130 years old in a second. I it just I feel yeah. amazing. And I don't the, the ice cream's yummy, like you said, but everyone out mm. there really needs to think about this. Like if I had some ice cream right now, every single time I've done it in the past before, I felt like garbage afterwards. I felt inflamed and my stomach's gurgling and bubbling. And it was never like, oh, gee, I'm glad I had that gigantic ice cream. I feel so much better now. I uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> so much, so much better this way. And, and, the, and people say, too, it's joyless. I disagree on that, too. I have a big rib mm. waiting for me at home right now. And every single day still, day 134, I am smiling when I'm eating it. I feel great. It tastes delicious. It's like the best thing in the world. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Here's another yeah. one. I'm athletic and I would never adopt a carnivore diet because it includes almost zero carbs. To thrive mm. physically, carbs are essential. If carnivore is so great, wouldn't the NFL have adopted it? Well, the New Zealand All Blacks have. You know, and they, and they are crushing it in the in the world stage in rugby. So you know they've been doing that for or at least low carb for for a number of years. In fact, there is a there's a guy, uh, Dr. Peter Brunkner, who's a uh, you know one of the top you know uh, sports medicine doctors in the world. He's down here in Australia, and he and he's worked with a number of different teams around Australia and turned them into uh, absolute machines. Uh, just going low carb, not even full carnivore, just getting rid of carbs, specifically just getting rid of carbs and going uh, going keto. Uh, the the Australian uh, national cricket team, they went and got thumped by England, and they lost you know all five five days of the of the test match, right? So they just got thumped, driven out of town. England was you know happy, hurrah! And so they went back six months later or so. They went and thumped India, which is a which is a major, major, major country to beat in cricket, right? And they thumped them five to nothing, right? I believe that's the case. And what was the difference? They went from getting thumped by England and then thumping a better team than England. What happened? Well, in that time, Peter Brunkner got to them and got them all on a low carb diet, got them off the carbohydrates, and they became such vicious athletes that they absolutely destroyed the competition after that. And you see that time and time again in, in professional sports. There are people doing carnivore. Trust me on that. They just don't want you to know about it. They don't want their competition to know about it because they get paid to play. And so they want that advantage. This is why people take steroids without telling anybody because it gives them an advantage over other people. Or maybe it puts levels the playing field against other people who are doing steroids as well. They want to make their spot. So they want to, they maybe, they love their teammates and all that sort of stuff. They still want to start that week. And so they want to be better than the guy who's gunning for his spot, right? Or her spot. And so they want that advantage. They don't necessarily want other people to know about it. I was always happy to everybody know my secret. They get my team better. I was, I was always happy for that. But, you know, a lot of people are just like, hey, this is, this is my livelihood. And I certainly don't want my competition knowing about it. So they kept it hush hush. And so there are a number of professional athletes that absolutely do do this. And, you know, and, and there's more and more and more data coming out with this. There's a professor, Tim Noakes from South, uh, South Africa, who was, um, he was like the major guy on the world stage of sport, sports medicine saying you need to eat carbs. You need carbs to burn carbs. You need these things for, for high, high, you know, high, high level athletics. And he just went, oh, my God, I'm wrong. I've lied to everybody. Because things when you stop eating carbohydrates, your body makes carbohydrates. So, yeah, you do need carbohydrates. But you have more carbohydrates if you stop eating them because your body makes it from your fat stores. And it makes it nearly instantly. So you're making blood sugar. You're making glycogen. You're making ketones as well. And you're constantly replenishing your, your liver and muscle glycogen. 
from your fat stores. So you have something like you know you know fifteen thousand kilojoules in your of um, of energy that you can stuff if you're carbo loading in your uh, you know the night before something like that. You stuff your liver full of from glycogen. That's sort of a maximum capacity. But you have one hundred and fifty thousand locked up in your fat source. So you, even for for a slim athlete, you'll have that. So you are going to run out of your stored glycogen far faster than you're going to run out of your, of your adiposity. And so you're going to keep, keep, keep replenishing that. And I played you know, professional sports, high level competitive rugby, uh, for 10, you know, 10 years before medical school and five years of that thereabouts was on uh, carnivore five years. That was not, I can tell you for a cold frozen fact that it was thousands of times better on carnivore. I couldn't get tired. I couldn't run out of energy. I couldn't get sore. I was at a dead sprint every second of every game, every training, every day. No one could uh, could out uh, you know beat me on, on fitness or anything. No one. There wasn't a single person that I ever came across that that could beat me uh, for endurance and fitness and things like that. Not a soul. You know, I was sprinting, you know, equivalents of marathons. And I remember thinking, I was like, I should enter a marathon because I could literally sprint it. I wouldn't get tired. I wouldn't be able to, I wouldn't have to stop. I could just be at a dead sprint for 26 miles. I'd set a world record on my first marathon and just be in the news. I thought I was just like, I should do that. But it, it, the thought of just running, you know, for 26 miles, just like the most boring thing that I could think of. You know, if I, if I'm running more than 40 meters and not hitting somebody, like I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'll probably hit somebody, you know, I'll just tell you that. So, you know, so like that, that was, that was what was worth it to me. But I thought I was like, okay, well, if, if one comes up, I'll, I'll do that. But you know, this is before the internet. So, um, I didn't, I didn't, uh, have anything to look up and I didn't really care to either, but, um, I was, uh, I felt way better, way better when I was doing that than any other point in my life, except for right now. And I'm back feeling that way. And at 38, I got back to a carnivore diet, realizing that that's what I was doing in my early 20s, from 20 to 25, just by happenstance. I just stopped eating plants because I, I learned how toxic they were to humans uh, in college. And I was just like, right, I'm not eating this crap. And I just defaulted into eating meat and eggs. And then at 38, I realized, okay, wow, that's what I was doing. That's I was I was living as we're designed to live. Humans are carnivores as a species. That's just the kind of animal that we are. And that's what I was doing. I was living as a carnivore, I was eating as a carnivore, and just like any other animal, you give us what we're designed to eat, we're gonna we're gonna do better. And so, at 38 years old, I went back on just carnivore. I was older, a lot older. You know, I hadn't played a full season of rugby in three years. I just come back from Bangladesh doing humanitarian work. hadn't worked out in months, right? Fat, out of shape. I was like 270 pounds. You know, I wasn't like oh oh. Well, I, I was technically a piece, <laughs> but, uh, you know, I can still, I still had like, you know, I can still sort of see my six pack and things like that, but I had a lot of extra weight. Normally like I'm sort of like, uh, you know, my playing weight is around 240, Right. So I had, I had definitely had like 30 extra pounds on me, probably more than that because I didn't have as much muscle. And within two weeks, I felt so good that I was like, right, I'm going out to play rugby again. It's 38 years old, fat and out of shape. And I went back and I just felt great again. I was like, right is can i do this like in my early 20s where i just push myself as hard as i can my body just responds i could so i was at a, a dead sprint every second of that training and you know couldn't wear myself out wasn't sore the next day like this is this is going to be bad for some people and so i just started you know training again and you know i just started feeling absolutely amazing shredded down stacked on muscle and just got better and better and better and more athletic and you know i'm 38 years old and you know i'm i'm out there competing with you know professional rugby players in their in their 20s right so it makes a massive difference this is and this is something i've worked with a lot of athletes um you know you can go to my my channel there's a playlist on on uh, bodybuilding and athletics there are athlete after athlete after athlete that is showing this is, this is they're absolutely killing it. a lot of professional athletes professional rugby players collegiate rugby players you know like top level european uh you know uh, rugby players in um uh, you know, university and, and professionals, and they're absolutely crushing it. They're just stacking on muscle, getting crazy fit and, and killing it. And their athleticism is going crazy. Ryan Talbot, uh, is, he's a great guy. He's been, I've had him on the podcast twice. He's an NCAA two-time All-American decathlete and NCAA one for Michigan state. Both of those 
all American titles were on a carnivore diet. He changed mid season, went carnivore, and as a mid season adaption, he said it was still he still uh, didn't find it was a downside. He felt you know that there were some adaption you know periods going on, but he actually felt amazing, and so he ended up doing so much better. He ended up setting you know winning the Big Ten championship in his first year uh, in doing the decathlon, set a school record. And then went to nationals and uh, earned all American honors, and you know got second the next year, and again earned all American honors. So, and he's just saying he's just getting better and better and better. And he was saying that he actually has to work out less because if he, if he's working out more and lifting weights, he actually puts on muscle too easily, right? Wow. And he doesn't want to be as jacked and muscular because you know he wants to be lighter. So he's got no fat to lose. So, you know, he needs to, he needs to keep his, his musculature down. So that's what you get on a carnivore diet. And the only reason that people in the NFL aren't doing it is because they just don't know about it. But as soon as they do, you can bet your ass that they will be doing it. Could you imagine a whole team of carnivores and the coach, the coach is a carnivore. That'd be amazing. Yeah. I yeah. like, you got to use your own two eyes too. Like, look at Dr. Chafee. Look at Dr. Baker. Look at all of these, the carnivore people you see too. And for myself, I have never been athletic or exercised. I couldn't do a pull up for a million dollars before I started carnivore. Every single day, every single morning, this morning included, I get up at five in the morning, I jog, I do pull ups, I do exercise. And it's like you said, I'm not even like lifting a bunch of weights, but that's what people have said. Well, Carrie, you lost so much weight and you're like, you're you're growing muscle. Like, what are you in the gym every single day? No, I have these resistance bands. I do these little pathetic resistance bands every day, but it's just like, it, it goes on so quickly. And the thing you said is so true. I never get tired anymore. Bike riding, jogging, whatever. I used to, I could go a little bit and then I would just be fatigued and trying to catch my breath and I, I couldn't catch up on carnivore. you like, it's crazy. You just, you don't get tired. You don't get that fatigue. Should yeah. we take maybe a, yep. I was, I was just going to say there, there, there's just a you know someone in, in the comments that, you know saying that it's got Josh Banks saying that extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence yeah so look up Tim Noakes Professor Tim Noakes he's putting out he's putting out copious amounts of study uh, you know randomized controlled trials like taking athletes and taking two groups of them randomizing them giving one carbs not giving the other carbs right getting them keto adapted and putting putting them to work and and checking their results they find that there's actually no letdown. Uh, in the keto crowd. So you're saying that you have to have carbs. Absolutely don't. Uh, and Tim Noakes has proven that. And in fact, now you don't have to run on your glycogen. You will run out of your glycogen. You only have you know an hour or two, depending on how much glycogen you have. So if you're doing really high intensity uh, sport, you're going to run out of that uh, a bit quicker as well, depending on how hard you're working. Uh, you don't run out of that when you're fat adapted, right? So he found that these people had had no drop in their athleticism, you know, in the in the in the short term. And they could just keep going where the other guys dropped off without refeeding and taking a bunch of sugar packets and things like that. And then he took them and switched them and fed the non-carb group carbs and the carb group no carbs, put them on a keto diet. Keto adapted them again, tested them again. There was no drop in performance by switching and and t coming off the carbs, so uh, yeah, you no, know, you're right. You know, uh, you, you make these sorts of claims, you need to have evidence, and it's there. Uh, look it up, Professor Tim Noakes. Great. Should yeah. we take and maybe Peter one? Brunkner and yeah, Dr. Peter Brunkner and uh, Paul Mason? All of these guys are putting out copious amounts of studies and research. It's amazing too that there's studies out there too, because I get that comment a lot and. It's hard to have studies for something like carnivore because there's not a lot of money to be made if everybody just eats meat and they do what they're That's supposed it. to. But the fact that there are is, is great. And uh, yeah. I was thinking maybe we got one more carnivore argument here and then maybe we could jump into some of the viewers' uh, questions and super chats. Uh, here's yeah. one. I get this comment all the time on my channel. My doctor insists I need fiber. How can I possibly do that on carnivore diet? Well, I mean, you ask them what the evidence is, you know, what, what they'll say, first of all, they won't know it, you know, because I, I guarantee you they've never actually looked at a single study uh, referencing fiber. But the the studies that do suggest that, that you do better with fiber and they do exist, these are A, epidemiological studies that are not interventional trials that you actually try to, con where you can prove cause and effect. And they say, well, when you increase fiber compared to the standard population eating a standard American diet, which is highly processed, 
garbage, which it doesn't have a lot of fiber because you, you can't put a lot of fiber in processed foods because you have to freeze it and ship it and all these sorts of things that when you do that, you're eating more fiber. So you're eating more whole foods. You're not eating all the processed crap. Okay. So you're, 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 that's not the same thing. You're not saying that the fiber is doing better. Well, no, you're just, you're, you're not just adding fiber to, you know, to a happy meal and to, you know, fries and process, you know, cookies and, and cakes and things like that. You know, you're, you're going to a whole food diet approach. So you're actually changing a lot of variables. So there's a lot of confounding factors, a lot of things that you're changing. You're getting rid of a lot of things that are really bad for you. You're adding things that are that respectively better for you that have fiber in them. And, and I would say that they are better. And so if, you, if you're looking at that contrast, of course, you're going to improve. So that's not the same thing. Right. So you, you're not saying that fiber is better. There's a lot of confounding factors. Maybe, maybe fiber is doing that, but maybe not. The only interventional trials have actually not been so favorable for, for uh, fiber. There was one that looked at, it was around sort of, you know, 75 people or so. So, you know, a smaller study, but it's really the only one that exists. And they split people up. They all had, they're all symptomatic for, you know, GI upset and distress. Um, and so, you know, take that for what you will, but they split them up into four groups. One kept eating the same amount of fiber. Group two, increase the amount of fiber. Group three, reduce the amount of fiber. Group four, eliminate fiber entirely. And wouldn't you know, more fiber made more GI upset. Same fiber, same amount of GI upset. Less fiber, less GI upset. No fiber completely fixed all symptoms in all participants, right? So the fiber seemed to have been causing the GI upset. Um, there was another study with over 2000 people looking at, you know, doing colonoscopies on these different people and looking for risk factors for diverticulosis, which is, you know, basically colon failure. You're drinking these out pouchings with failure of that organ and uh, you get quite sick. You can get diverticulitis. They can be an infection of the diverticulosis. Um, you can get ruptures and you can die. You know, it's very serious. Um, so they found in over 2000 people, the only risk factors, uh, increased risk factors of developing diverticulosis. First of all, age, as, as you get older, it's just more likely that you're going to damage your body enough to develop this. Um, but then after that, it was just fiber, more fiber, not less fiber, more fiber and more bowel motions. So people that were having on average more than 15 bowel motions a week had a, a massively increased risk of uh, developing diverticulosis, right? So you're eating a whole bunch of plant matter with fiber in it. You cannot digest that. You cannot absorb that. You cannot use that. You have to eliminate it by design, right? And so you're going to be, you know, going to the bathroom more often than other people, right? So constipation was not associated with diverticulosis. That's, that's what it's attributed. Oh, you're getting constipated and fiber helps with constipation. No, constipation was not a risk factor. Meat was not a risk factor. Dietary fat was not a risk factor. More fiber, more bowel motions, probably from the fiber, were the only associations. They were strongly correlated as well. It was like a 600, 700% increased risk, right? Those are the studies that exist on fiber that you know actually tell you something. Love it. Wow, we have over a thousand people on right now. 1,051. Oh, nice. uh, Jesus. We've got a bunch of super chats and questions and fears from the viewers here. So I thought maybe we would jump into some of those. A couple of new members here. Jeff, thank you. And Kip, thank you. Anyone that joins and becomes a member on my channel, every penny from that goes towards the carnivore diet documentary. So I really appreciate it. all super chats that I get uh, go to that as well. Here's a question for Dr. Chafee. 39-year-old overweight has IIH has CSF leak nasally and on Diamex. I read diet may help IIH. Would carnivore diet help because I read low fat sodium is suggested. Neurosurgeon suggested a shunt. Yeah, well, so I mean, there's different causes of, of IIH. Diamox is just a medication that can reduce the amount of CSF that we produce in our brain. Uh, CSF leak, that's not great. You know, that that should be addressed. Sometimes those will heal spontaneously. But if that if that doesn't, then, you know, there, she'll need an intervention. That's a very, very big risk of developing meningitis, you know, getting a bacteria up through uh, that break, wherever the break is. 
um, you know, in, in their nose to uh, into the brain. So that's a, that's a big deal. Um, so it sounds like she's being on treatment for that. But however, you know, if you, if you sort of keep leaking and leaking and leaking, I mean, that, that needs to be addressed. Like that's, that's a, that's a big deal. She can uh, get very, very sick and, and uh, you know, be life threatening. Um, IIH, you know, I don't, I don't know offhand. There might be studies. First of all, you know, going back to that, that other gentleman, there are literally thousands of very high level studies, interventional trials, control trials, and so on with ketogenic diets in humans and animals, thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of these things now that show specific benefits in many, many, many different issues. And so it's becoming much more popularized in medical circles now. And there, there could be one for IAH. I'm not, I'm not sure. I don't know of any studies, but you know what? It's, um, it's how our body was designed anyway, was just to eat meat and not eat all the other things that can cause direct harm to our body. So, you know, either way, I think it's, it's in her best interest and everyone's best interest to, to go on a biologically appropriate diet. And all the best evidence shows that what that is for, for humans is a, is a high fat meat based diet. And I think that will help in a lot of other ways. Um, you know, whether it helps with that, I, I don't know. Um, that's something I'll, I'll make a note of and I'll try to look up and see if we have any studies on keto. There won't be any for carnivore, but you know, there would be for keto and carnivore diet is a keto ketogenic diet, or it really should be, I think. And so I'll, I'll take a look for that, but I think it's, I think it's worth a try anyway, but, um, if that keeps leaking, you know, need to be on top of her doctors to make sure that that gets investigated because that, that might need to be surgically, uh, uh, stopped up. You know, a CSF leak is, is a very, very big deal. All right. Alia Wells, $20. Hi, Carrie and Dr. Chafee. First donation for the doc. Let's get those super chats going. Thank All you, right. Alia. Alia is awesome. Thank she you very much. A whole bunch of funds earlier. Uh, Bishop's Deep Learning, meat causes an insulin response. Can you elaborate on why this is not a problem and it's okay to eat meat multiple times per day? Yeah, so, you know, the thing is, is that when you, it's first of all, the protein that, that causes an insulin response, not fat. Fat does not trigger an insulin response. When you're eating, people go by the glycemic index, uh, will get a bit, get fooled by this because you'll see protein has a, has a higher um you know, glycemic, you know, insulin response, but uh, that's not actually the case. That's only in com combination with uh, carbohydrates. So if you're not eating carbohydrates, you won't have as big of a jump in your insulin response, okay? Or blood sugar or your insulin response. And so if you're just eating meat and you have a large bolus of, of protein that comes with you know, eating until you're full, Yes, you'll get you'll get a, a slight rise in your blood sugar, much smaller than than you would if you were eating carbohydrates. And yes, you'll get a you'll get a rise in your insulin as well. However, you will then get a correspondingly high, if not higher, release of glucagon, which opposes insulin, brings that back down, brings your insulin, your blood sugar back down, normalizes that, normalizes your insulin as well. So it's actually a normal physiological process. That's part of you know, the physiological response when we're eating, and that's okay. You know, it's, um, you know, people talk about, you know, oh, we shouldn't be in ketosis all this time or whatever. You're not. If you eat a big steak, you will come out of ketosis temporarily and then you'll get back into it afterwards. And so, you know, that that's that's the issue there. It's not it's not a big deal for that reason. You're not going to spike your insulin. You're not going to spike your blood sugar for a prolonged period of time. So you're not going to kick yourself out of, uh, you know, therapeutic ketosis or nutritional ketosis. Um, if you're worried about that. So, uh, you know, so that's fine. Also, you know, we are designed to eat a certain way. I think that way is just eating meat. That's, you know, what our ancestors did throughout the, the ice ages. And, and, uh, even more recently, the native Americans in the plains are eating, you know, buffalo and pemmican and things like that. They were extraordinarily healthy living 120 years by their records. So I know, I guess they're, we can just call them liars, I guess, but that's what they were saying. And, you know, and you have people talking about how they were in the war of 1812 and describing this and describing that. And you're like, it's 1920 and you were fighting in the war of 1812. And they're like, ah, okay, maybe he's just making it up. Whatever. You can think what you want. I'll think what I want. But either way, they were extraordinarily healthy and they were found to be the tallest human beings on earth, right? Your average height of a population denotes the average health of a population. They were just eating largely, they're just eating 
meat, fatty meat. And so whatever your, whatever your body does, whatever your physiology does, whatever your biochemistry does, when you're giving it its input, when cows eat grass, something happens. When lions eat gazelle, something happens. Maybe they go out of ketosis for a while. They get an insulin response. You know, when whales eat, you know, a lot of krill or whatever, something's happening. But when they're eating what they're supposed to eat, what happens is supposed to happen. And that's the same thing for us. So I think that that the evidence shows that humans are designed to eat meat. That's what we evolved on. And that means that's what we're supposed to eat. What we've been eating for the entire existence of humanity, that is by definition what we're adapted to, right? That's how that works, right? So two, three million years of just eating meat or predominantly eating meat, that is what we're adapted to eating. That's what we're going to do best on. And so if you're just eating what you're designed to eat, your body's going to do what it's designed to do. So if your insulin goes up a bit, great. I'm, I'm not too worried about it. I've literally never checked my ketones or blood sugar because I just don't care because I'm eating what I'm supposed to eat. My body's doing what it's supposed to do. And, and that's all that really matters. I get that question a lot. I'm like, what would I do differently? There's nothing I could do any differently to affect that number. Uh, Troy yeah. said question in another post. Thank you for all you do. I'll, I'll, I'm looking right now to see if I can find that other post. Thank you so much. Uh, Ro Bono, $20 super chat. Thank you for all you're doing. Question. Could you address the effects of cream again? Well, the main, the main thing, so cream is going to have a lot of, uh, very positive fatty acids. Um, in fact, so, so this is something I was actually reading, uh, Dr. Robert Lustig's book, uh, metabolical, which is a fantastic book. And it sort of blows a lot of the case open on processed foods and, and, uh, fructose in particular, and, uh, and really, you know, does a, a scathing review of, the. uh, uh I, he actually talks about the, the seven day Adventists and the, uh, food, um, companies and things like that, food and drug companies, how this is, this is not, they're not doing things for you that they should. Um, and he spoke about, you know, the fats in, in uh, dairy and their odd chained uh, saturated fatty acids, right? And so, you know, meat has even chained and these do different things in your body. This is, this is the whole idea of, you know, calories in, calories out is, is a bit insane to me. Anyone who's taken biochemistry should know better. And anyone who hasn't taken biochemistry uh, should should do that before they start talking about this. Um, these chemical, the, these, these compounds are different or very complex organic chemicals. They have different complex chemical interactions in your body. So you have dozens of, of carbohydrates. They do different specific things in your body. You have dozens of different amino acids. They do different specific things and have different chemical and hormonal responses in your body. Same goes with your fatty acids. So you have saturated fatty acids in milk and they are odd chained uh, fatty acids. They seem to be actually cardioprotective, right? So you're drinking cream. That is a, you're getting a lot of positive fatty acids, saturated fatty acids, which are good for you, cardioprotective uh, from various studies. And uh, they're, they're taking out a lot of the proteins and things like that as well. So, you know, a lot of good things there. Some people respond to dairy. Some people have a problem with dairy for whatever's in, in there. A lot of people are responding to the casein, which is, you know, one of the proteins that milk has. And a lot of people respond to that. And so they usually have to avoid that. Most creams will get out most of that, but it'll, they'll probably still have some in there. So if you're very sensitive to that, you can have a problem with that. I don't think there's too much of a problem having cream or other fats because we need a lot of fat. You know, we typically need around one gram of fat per one gram of protein about for different people. It's going to be slightly different, maybe up or down, depending on your activity level uh, and your protein demands and things like that from, from athletics or lifting, you know, you're going to need a bit different. So, so everyone needs to, to mold that to their own um, situation, but it's shoot for gram for gram and then adjust from there for yourself. But you have a limited capacity to absorb fat. It's actually very difficult for your body to absorb fat without bile. You only make a limited amount of bile every day. And once that runs out, you, you can't really absorb fat. You can absorb some, but it's, it's very low figures, like 10 to 15%, largely uh, medium chain fatty acids. So most of that's going to go out. And that's actually what keeps your stool soft. This is why you don't get uh, well, if you're eating enough fat, you don't get constipated on a carnivore diet. You'll get the hard, dry, rocky stools. You'll get infrequent stools, but that's not constipation. Constipation is the consistency of stools, not the frequency of stools. And so if you're not eating a whole bunch of fiber, you're just not 
getting rid of a lot of waste because you're absorbing 98 to 99% of the meat that you're eating. And so you don't have much waste to go out. It's actually a lot more convenient to just not be on the toilet all day. And so cream, you know, you, you add some of that stuff in. Some people will have some, some issues with some of the things in there. And so, you know, maybe that's not something you want to do, but most people will be okay with it. I do find that some people with dairy, any dairy seems to stall. There's something in there that can, that can trigger your body not to, not to lose as much fat or even put on weight. Um, not everybody, but some people find that that's a stall. So if, if that's you, then just cut out the dairy and just go to just meat and water, even just red meat and water. And most people do, do fine with that. But, but by and large, cream's fine, you know, unless there's a specific problem for you. Yeah, I love your statement too, not to be indelicate, but I was at the grocery store the other day and you look in people's mm -hmm. carts and it's 99% stuff that's going straight in and then straight <laughs> out. Like and it's funny and it's crazy. But then when you think about it, imagine the toll it's putting on your body, processing all of that garbage for me for 42 years, processing all this stuff that literally is going in one end out the other. And it's just complete waste. It's it's kind of crazy. This yeah. next one here from Troya, she left the earlier super chat and she said she left another comment. I found it. Here it is. Question. Had labs done after nine months on carnivore, cholesterol 246, HDL 66, triglycerides 59, LDL 165. Dr. Thinks <laughs> doomed. Thoughts? Yeah. Oh, well, look, you know, I mean, obviously you have to take these in, in, the, in the particular context of the individual, but, it, you know, just looking at those numbers, you know, that, that wouldn't really bother me. You'll refer back to, you know, my, my, my 20 minute answer on the first question. Cholesterol was just never a problem. It was just never a problem in the first place. Um, we talked about pattern A and pattern B type cholesterol, the large, buoyant, fluffy, nice LDL cholesterol that your body makes and that statins destroy. Um, that, those are, are great for you. If you have higher HDL, which you do, you have your HDL is in a great range and you have lower triglycerides, which you do, your triglycerides are in a great range. You are much more likely to have an abundance of the large, buoyant, fluffy, nice, good LDL um, cholesterol, uh, LDLC molecules, and uh, and that's great, you know. So that that's that's what you want. If your triglycerides were sky high and your HDL was quite low, then you would likely have more likely have pattern B, the small, dense, damaged, glycated, oxidized, damaged, uh, you know, LDLs that are have a have a seventy percent increased association with heart disease. But again, metabolic syndrome is 600% increased rate and diabetes is 1000% increased rate and smoking is around the same. So I just, I just don't see these things as a major problem. LDL is just not associated with these things. If it was, if it was your SDLDL, okay, 1.7X, right? But you don't have SDLDL. You will almost certainly have pattern A. And so again, it's just cholesterol just simply was not the marker that we were told it was. It was a lie. Uh, for more on that, I do a big in-depth look at the literature and, um, and you know, the published literature, peer-reviewed studies in the major uh, medical journals around the world on uh, the, you know, the, the truth about cholesterol and heart disease. And it just goes through them. So, so people can watch that and uh, know all they need to, to know about that. But if your HDL is high, especially if your HDL is equivocal or higher than your triglycerides, you you are in very good good stead. That's uh, that's a sign of good metabolic health. And I would be happy with that. And again, you know, higher LDL, any LDL uh, is associated with longer life. So what are we doing here? You know, why, why are we worrying about this? People with higher LDL live longer. So what the hell? Right. All right. From Boris, question, as a carnivore bodybuilder, I can't seem to get enough food in, but adding carbs mm. at 10 grams makes my brain work way less. Help for a hard gainer. Yeah. So, you know, the thing is, is that is that low carbs is, is worse than no carbs because now you're going to you're going to ratchet up your insulin. You're going to cut off your ketones. Your brain wants to run on ketones. Now you're running out of the glucose. You don't have ketones. Your brain doesn't work. Your body doesn't work either. You're actually going to shoot yourself in the foot from a glycogen standpoint as well. Also, when you eat carbohydrates, you raise your insulin. Insulin uh, blocks the secretion and action of growth hormone, and it also disrupts your testosterone as well. So this is not actually what you want, uh, I don't think. You know, that's a personal opinion, but it's not what I want. 
I don't want my growth hormone being blocked, especially if I'm trying to build muscle and be lean and athletic and strong. I want my, my growth hormone to be, you know, up where it's supposed to be. So, uh, you know, this is why, you know, you shouldn't, why I think you shouldn't eat, um, carbs before you go to bed is because you raise your insulin, you, you maximally secrete growth hormone as, um, when you're asleep, especially two hours after you go to sleep, as long as you go to sleep on time, that's very important. And so by jacking up your insulin, you're, you're slowing that down. You're, you're lowering the amount that your body's actually secreting and you're blocking its action too. So you'll actually get a, get a corresponding drop in your insulin like growth factor one, which is sort of how we test for the, the action and functionality and uh, amount of HGH. So I would avoid carbs um, at all. You know, if you wanted to go the other way and go back to the old way, you, you need more carbs than that. Like if you're going to run on carbs, you, you need to eat enough carbs to run on. And then you put on glycogen, you also put on fat, you get a bulk, right? So if you're, if you're going for a competition, probably a good idea to eat some carbs the night before because you'll get that pump swell the next day because you'll get you'll pack in a bunch of glycogen in your muscles. You'll also bring in water and that and you'll, you'll get more of a plumped look. And so that's something that car that, um, uh, bodybuilders have done for a while is, is that they just eat carbs just the night before uh, a competition. Um, and, uh, from what I understand, and that, that gives them a big pump. Ronnie Coleman talks about that as well. Just the day before you like eat a pizza and they just, boom, you just like killed it the next day, just veins popping out and everything like that. Not something you want to do every day you know, to maintain that physique. However, you know, just before you're going to get that big glycogen water pump. Um, as far as doing this carnivore and doing it right. So I have a number of, of interviews with professional bodybuilders who have won major tournaments, international tournaments and things like that. Like, you know, uh, Richard Smith, uh, who won the Euro British national title as a pro. And, uh, that was a tested event. And so obviously he was not uh, on juice and then he won the European um, championship as a pro. And that, that was not a tested event, but he still won it naturally. So he beat people on steroids, even though he was natural and, and he was doing that as carnivore. And so, yes, it's, it's difficult. You, you do, you just need to eat more. So you have to eat more often during the day. It's hard because, you know, when you're working out, if you eat before that, you're just going to make yourself lethargic. You're going to put yourself into a rest and digest mode. You're going to, you know, pump a bunch of blood towards your uh, intestines and that's blood that's not available for your brain and your muscles. So that's not great, but you, you can time these things. You can sort of eat a bit more, a bit more. This is what Arnold Schwarzenegger did. You know, he said this in, the, in his movie Pumping Iron, and this was back in the day when they just ate steak and eggs. You just steak and eggs, steak and eggs, steak and eggs, because that's what you know, the iron guru, uh, Vince Garanda used to say, you just eat steak and eggs all week. They had, you know, Sunday, they would have, they would have a, like a clean carb loading day, but the rest of the week it was just steak and eggs. And when they were cutting, they would all carbs. That was just steak and eggs, steak and eggs, steak and eggs, steak and eggs. That was it. And they were, they were just getting shredded and jacked. And those were, those were all the best, uh, performers. Arnold was of this school. He learned from these guys. He was the next, next generation down. And obviously he added, you know, steroids to the equation and, and did very well, but the, the, the eating uh, dynamic, you know, he got from them. And so he just ate meat. And so he talks about this. He's like, I, I can't, I'm, I'm not like one of those guys. Why can't you just eat just all this meat? Um, his body image idol was a guy named Serge Nubre, N-U-B-R-E-T. Uh, he was a French guy. Man was jacked, absolutely jacked. He would eat six pounds of horse meat a day. Right. And so, uh, and Arnold was, was referring to these guys who could just eat copious smells like the Mongols. They would eat, you know, they would ravage the countryside for five days in a row, not eating. And then they'd eat, you know, 10 pounds of horse meat in one go, you know, in one day or whatever, and then go do it again. Um, so what Arnold was saying is just like, you know, I've got to have, you know, eggs here. I've got to have a, you know, 10 ounce steak here, another 12 ounce steak there, another thing there, another this there, another this there. And he was just talking about meat. So you just, you have to space it out. You have, you have to, you know, um, Build this out through the day. You need to get enough. There's no, there's no real cheats to it. You just have to get the food in your mouth, and um, you know, so you have to do that multiple times throughout the day. If you eat too much, you're going to get lethargic. So if you're going to eat during the day and you still got to work out later, you want to eat sort of a half amount, just sort of take the edge off, have a bit later, a bit now, a bit now, a bit now, a bit later, and then hit your workout. Go really hard. Eat a lot after that. Maybe you have two a days or something like that. Okay, give yourself several hours in between, then get another one. So this is, this is a problem with um, you know my friend uh, Ryan Talbot, the NCAA you know uh, track star, right? So now he's got it down, 
where he he's able to eat enough and he's, he's the problem is he's putting on too much muscle where before he was actually losing muscle he was actually losing weight he's like hey i'm losing too much weight you know what do i do and it was just like hey you, you just have to eat more you have to you have to get these things in you have to work these things in so he was able to work those in if he had a morning workout morning uh you know session with the team he would go and do that first and then he'd eat after that and you know go have another session and eat after that so he just worked in extra meals throughout the day and that's what you have to do too you just have to do what arnold did is just sort of maybe get him in piecemeal and then you know sort of after your main workouts in the evening as eat as much as you can a couple hours later try to eat as much as you can if you got to eat more in the morning do that but just keep getting food in but just stick to the fatty meat and water um 10, 10 grams of fat or 10 grams of carbs is going to, is, is going to, um, really slow you down. And, uh, and you're sort of be caught in the middle. You won't, you won't be one or the other and, and you get sort of the worst of both worlds. And, um, as far as energy wise. And so, you know, um, I would suggest just dropping the carbs altogether, but if you're going to have any carbs, you need to have enough carbs to actually fuel you. All right. Barry Simon, $20 super chat. Dr. Chafee, have you heard of Anthony William and his medical medium site? If so, opinions. <laughs> um, so I have heard of that. Um, it's, it's sort of a, it's sort of an interesting concept, right? So I'm going to say a funny concept. I would say a funny concept. So he, he's an actual medium, as, as he says, I mean, who is an actual medium? I don't, I don't know. It was the, you know, the amazing Randy was a magician who actually said, had uh, in the eighties, he was saying, I'll give you a million dollars. Anybody standing off or anyone in the world, a million dollars to prove scientifically that you have psychic powers, million dollars. No one, a lot of people took him up on it. No one, no one actually was able to do it. Um, so is this guy an actual medium? So this is, this is a gentleman who says he's actually channeling spirits. And they're giving him medical advice. I don't know why they aren't giving him lottery numbers, but you know, they, um, they, uh, he said that he's, he's channeling the spirit of compassion. Is that, I don't know if that's biblical, probably not. You know, this is just like, what, I don't know what the spirit of compassion is. I don't know what that means. Um, if there's a spirit of compassion, is there, are there spirits of, of other sorts of, you know, feelings towards people? Presumably. Um, maybe the, the spirit of mischief is saying it's the spirit of compassion and actually leading him down the wrong way. But anyway, there's, there's some sort of spirit guy that's actually giving him medical advice and people are listening to this for some reason. And, um, I haven't looked at a lot of the things that he said, you know, I think some of the, some of the stuff, he, you know, like plant-based, this and that, but he's actually giving medical advice on some of these things, which is, which is not okay. That's actually illegal. And it's very dangerous, you know, telling people, you know, about different, you know, biochemical, sort of pathways and this is why this works and i was like no that's that's really not like i mean i can i can show you any number of textbooks that, that are very clear on the biochemistry of that sort of that process and that that's not it um so no I, I don't think that's someone you want you want to listen to i mean this, this is this is a you know this is someone who maybe he believes this but i would doubt that you know i mean this is there's been a lot of frauds and hucksters that uh you know say they have some sort of powers or whatever i mean you should look up on on youtube there was like people in the 50s or you know and earlier that were all about you know it's all you know uh, outer space alien sort of things and, and, and just people just coming out of everywhere oh yeah so my experience with aliens and all these sorts of things just making up these stories and when people was like oh yes i'm in psychic communication with you know queen azalea of the galaxy and you know, we talk on a daily I mean, who the hell are you like why would this person if they actually were running the galaxy like why are they talking to you <laughs> you know like i mean we're not even interstellar yet you don't even you know know about us or anything like that but they, you're just going on they're they're hilarious right but this is this is one of those things i mean you know i, I don't want to i don't know the guy um but i mean realistically he's either delusional or a con artist and i don't think that that's anyone you want to take medical advice from all right uh carmen question i bought a half a lamb and it comes with sausages made with rosemary and honey is that okay or should i give it a miss cheers yeah just throw it at passing cars you know? <laughs> um uh look you know it, it's it's up to you you know I, I i don't like eating that stuff um you know, it, it does make me feel worse. And so, you know, I like feeling my best all the time. Um, you know, you could try them if, if you, if you think it's okay, maybe it has honey in it, um, that can trigger sugar cravings. That can, I mean, it is addictive, you know, fructose is addictive and honey tends to have more fructose than high fructose corn syrup. And, and fructose is the part that's actually chemically addictive 
to our brain. And so having that could trigger that. Um, and if that's something, you know, that you've had issues with in the past and had to, you know, deal with sort of carb and sugar addicted and, you know, might be good to give it a miss, you know, how much is in the sausages? Probably not all that much. And so, you know, as sort of a one-off, is that big of a deal? Just depends. You know, it, it might be a big deal to you. It might be that you have some and it's uh, and it's a problem. But, you know, if you if you try them and you feel okay with them and uh, maybe they make you feel a bit, you know, a bit gross or something like that, but it goes away and it's not causing you to go then, you know, down a carb hole and, and eat a whole bunch of, you know, sugar and things like that, then, uh, you know, I would, you know, you know, just have them while you're there or maybe, you know, give them to other people who aren't too worried about it. And then, you know, the next time you you do that, just ask them not to include that stuff in there and just ask them just to use salt only. The thing with sausages too, they generally have um, different sorts of binders that are generally plant derived so that when you, when you cook that sausage and you cut it, it stays together. Whereas normally if you don't have those plant derived binders, uh, the meat just sort of falls out of the casing. Uh, so that's a, that's another thing too. So I tend to avoid things like sausages and those sorts of things. Occasionally, if I'm traveling or whatever, and there, there's something there, and I'm you know just sort of at a restaurant, I might have that. But I, I, I tend not to feel my best when I do that. And so if I if I see it, it has a whole bunch of green stuff and things like that in it, I, I generally give those a miss. All right, uh, Kitty, ten dollars super chat. Thank you. Question. 73 year old female with 80 pkd strict carnivore 45 days uh diagnosed with cyst infection seven days ago prescribed leviquin 750 mg times 10 days would keto help this lipophilic ab enter the cyst um you know that's a good question i don't know i don't know if uh, keto would help your antibiotic in its action in your body but being on a ketogenic diet has been shown to improve your uh, immune system. Your immune system runs better. Your your cellular immunity works better. You're dropping inflammation. Your body's, you know, what is, what is inflammation? Inflammation is basically activating your immune system in, in, in inappropriate ways. So you're going to suppress that. You're not going to have inappropriate inflammation. Your body's just going to be doing the things that it needs to do. And your, your, um, you know, healing and, uh, your immune system actually works better. So I, I would say that now, you know, to do with, you know, I'm, I'm assuming that's, uh, talking about polycystic, uh, kidney disease, but, um, you know, the thing is, is that I, it's not something that I've seen myself, but I, I was literally just in a conversation today with, um, uh, one of the doctors from low carb down under, um, over in Sydney. And, um, and there was a patient who was sort of asked about, polycystic kidney disease. And he, he referred me over to another uh, doctor colleague of, of his that has basically been doing research in this. So I'm, I'm going to about to be communicating with them because they said that there's actually a lot of promising research coming out with polycystic kidney disease and, and nutrition, which is great. I mean, most things are, are related to nutrition and you have a, a genetic predisposition and then environmental trigger. So you have, you know, you have the genes for polycystic uh, kidney disease. Um, and then, but that's not necessarily, you won't necessarily get a 100% penetrance. So not 100% of people who have the gene get the disease. Right. And so something in the environment sort of triggering that. And so, you know, that it could be that there's, there's nutritional issues as well. So I'll be looking into that. I don't know exactly what they are. However, I can tell you that studies have, you know, people say, oh, you have polycystic disease. Okay. You need to reduce your, your protein. I, I don't think that's that's um, a good idea. Um, you know, these studies, there are studies in, in, uh, with people looking at more protein actually increases and boosts uh, kidney function. I don't think so. these were done with people with polycystic disease. So, you know, take that for what it is, but in most people, more protein, more meat, improved kidney function. And this is actually, I, I see this a lot all the time, people with, with kidney disease, you know, stage four kidney failure. I've seen people come out of that and, and return normal kidney function. And that, that happens regularly. And, and we see this in the literature, more protein, you get improved kidney function. Um, some people will get freaked out because their urea goes up. So people track urea and creatinine and they say, oh, these go up. That means your body's not clearing these. But then their urea goes up and oh my gosh, your kidneys are, are being shot. But for some reason, the creatinine is exactly the same. So why is that? The urea goes up because 
you're metabolizing more amino acids. And so that's, a, that's just a byproduct of amino acid um, uh, degradation. And it's actually your body's, one of your body's strongest antioxidants. So it's actually a good thing. So you're doing good things in your bodies, you know? So you don't need all those antioxidants in plants that actually come with a lot more oxidants than just antioxidants uh, because you have, you have, you're getting a lot more urea as well. And that's doing a lot of work there. Um, so that can help kidney function. And there, there seems to be some ties in with ketogenic diets and polycystic disease. But I don't know if that's going to help bring the antibiotics into the cyst, though, unfortunately. But it can help in a lot of other ways that could help and support, um, you know, you or, or that person with, uh, with recovery from that infection and from uh, dealing with that illness. Uh, just real quick, because this is right on that same topic. You mentioned kidney failure. So Ali is asking... Mm -hmm. Could someone with stage four kidney failure on dialysis do carnivore? Oh, one hundred percent. You can absolutely do carnivore. Um, it doesn't matter what your your medical condition is; you're still human. And so, you know, either way, our biologically adapted and designed diet is going to be is going to be right and correct for you. So, uh, yeah, it, it's important, especially when we're sick, to be eating a proper diet. And so I definitely have seen people with kidney failure improve on that. Now people, now people on kid, on um, dialysis, you know, can you improve off of that? You know, that, that remains to be seen. I have seen anecdotally three people. Now there are studies showing that more protein improves kidney function. Okay. So that's, that's in the literature, but the, you know, past that is, is anecdotal, but I've seen it again and again and again, people improve kidney function, even after a stage four not being on dialysis yet. And I've seen three people so far on dialysis that, um, that have come off dialysis. It takes a long time. So one, one lady, it took nine months. Uh, the other two people, it, it took over a year, but it, but it happened. So, um, and I'm sort of keeping track of a few other people at the moment who are on dialysis and doing carnivore and they're doing very well. And in fact, you know, they're, they're symptomatically much better. They're getting much, much healthier. Uh, they're not feeling as horrible before they're, uh, dialysis as they, they were before and things like that. So, you know, I mean, either way, you know, say, Oh my God, that's going to trash your kidneys. What kidneys? They're, they're already on dialysis. Right. So, I mean, you, you get, you don't get, you don't get past, you know, total kidney failure. Right. So, um, it's not going to cause problems. It, it's, you know, shouldn't, it's not going to make them sick. It's actually, it sh actually should improve them. Right. You're, you're giving your body more of what it needs to help, help itself and get better in, every way and you're eliminating out things that cause harm there are a lot of plant toxins that are directly nephrotoxic so they damage your kidneys or they block them up and cause damage uh you know via you know, blockages such as uh, oxalate so oxalate binds calcium they form calcium oxalate stones 75 percent of, of kidney stones or or thereabouts are calcium oxalate stones right so you're eliminating all that stuff from your body you're eliminating a lot of things that can harm your kidneys and you're providing your body a lot of things that are actually beneficial for your kidneys so yes you can 100 do it will it get them off dialysis i really hope so i can't promise anything all right dc i have two questions is it true that during the ice ages there was no fruit and honey at all and what do you think about people that say to feel more energetic doing carnivore, add fruit and honey in moderation, of course? Uh, yeah, I mean, you, you can get more energetic adding cocaine too, right? So, you know, is that is that a good idea, you know? Um, I don't think so. I've got tons of energy. It is 1138 at night uh, where I am. And I've, I've been at work since, you know, early this morning seeing patients. And now I'm talking a mile a minute because I have tons of energy. I have not eaten yet today. I feel fine. I have, you know, I certainly haven't eaten any fruit or honey. So, you know, no, you absolutely don't need uh, fruit and honey, just like you don't need cocaine. Um, you know, you'll have tons of energy. You'll have plenty of energy and you'll feel better than literally you ever have in your entire life. If you're eating enough meat, and, and giving yourself uh, eating enough fat and giving yourself what it needs. I think a lot of people that, that sort of go into the fruit and honey side of things, there are a lot of people that eat a lot of organs. They eat a lot of, um, you know, organ meats and liver, and you can actually get uh, toxicities. You can get the hypervitaminosis A, which can you know, tank your thyroid and make you feel pretty crappy, tank your hormones in other ways as well. And so, you know, going on fruit and honey and things like that, that can actually increase your body's demand for vitamin A and other vitamins. And it could be that that sort of levels you out a bit. I don't know. That's sort of just something I've been sort of throwing around in my head, but something's happening. And I tend to see people who do that are the ones that are eating a lot of liver. I bear, I, I've eaten liver four times in the last 10 years. 
right? And so, you know, well, yeah, you know, beef and, and lamb liver. I've had I've had cod liver, tins of cod liver and cod liver oil like a few times as well. Um, but that, uh, but otherwise, no. Um, as far as the ice ages are concerned, um, well, they were certainly there were, there were fruit and honey in some areas, more towards the equator. And, you know, some vegans and liars will say that, uh, you know, during the ice ages that people were just moving towards the equator and just kept eating, you know, fruit and plants and all that sort of garbage because it sort of, you know, tells the lie that, you know, if we're, we're up in these ice shelves living as the way the Inuit do now, which is the natural state of humanity is the way the Inuits are living now, that, uh, well, the, how they traditionally live anyway, how, you know, how a lot of them are living is not, is not how we're supposed to live, but you know, the ones living traditionally that, that, that's how we lived. You know, we lived in the ice. There was no plants at all in a lot of these places. And we we're just eating, we we're just eating meat. And so, you know, the people will say, Oh, well, we were moving towards the equator and things like that. That, that is, that is someone who has never looked at the fossil record. They're just, they're just hoping that's true because it, because it shows that they're right about something. Um, no, that's actually wrong. So as the ice shelves started coming down, the fossil record is very clear. We started going up. We started attacking into the ice because that's where the megafauna was most likely. And that's what we were hunting. That's what we wanted to eat. These big fuzzy animals that, you know, fed us and, you know, made us warm. So that's, that's what we were doing. And so while there, there were, you know, you know, fruits and, ve and um, vegetables and, and honey and all that sort of stuff available in certain areas. And I'm, I'm sure that homo sapiens or not homo sapiens. Well, well, in the last ice age, last few ice ages would have been homo sapiens, but you know, not, not early on, um, you know, would have been around that, you know, maybe those ones, you know, incorporated that first of all, fruit seasonal, and it's not nearly as sweet in the wild as, you know, as as it is in in the store. I mean, think of the difference between, you know, like a red delicious and a crab apple you found in a park somewhere. You know, I mean, it's, this is not the same creature, and so you know, it's, it's sour, it's hard, it's just not it's not great. The, the crab apples, right? So we we've bred these things to be many many more times as sweet and have many many more times the amount of sugar, and have you know much less fiber and things like that. I mean, look at mangoes, normally just all seed, you know, bit of fibrous, you know, meat and things like that and uh, and barely any sugar. Now it's, you know, seeds much smaller, whole bunch of, you know, pulp and it was just packed with sugar. And there are areas, and I spoke to, when the research was coming out about how bad fructose was and how it was, you know, really a, a causative factor in type 2 diabetes, I mentioned that to a friend of mine who is, who's uh, from India, uh, who's a doctor. And he said, you know, that's actually really interesting because there's an area in India, I you know, forget the name of it at this point, it was you know, 12 years ago, but um, he said that that in that area, the, the mangoes grow so plentiful that they're just falling all over the place and just basically everyone there just eats mangoes for three months while they're in season. Just, just every day they're just eating mangoes, 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 they don't eat anything else. And they have the highest rates of type 2 diabetes in all of India. And in fact, the government had to do an intervention and just say, you're not allowed to eat this. You have to eat other things. You can only eat a limited amount of, of mangoes a day uh, because of that. So, you know, sure, there was, there was fruit and honey somewhere. It wasn't always available. It certainly wasn't as sweet as it is now. Honey would have been just as sweet probably, but the fruit would not have been as sweet. It also only be available for a couple of weeks and then not the rest of the year. And... Um, you know, and then fruit, and they would only be available in some places. You know, a lot of people, most people, were up in the icy areas where no, that stuff did not exist, and we did not have access to it, uh, even for part of the year. You know, most of the Earth was covered in ice, and um, year round. You know, so some areas that would have thawed out, sure, but most people in most areas were not getting any of that. So we definitely didn't need it. You know, there certainly wasn't any fruit and honey on the land bridge from Asia to North America on the last ice age when people crossed over and populated North and South America, right? So what were they eating, right? What do the Inuits eat? So if you have to have fruit or honey or carbs of any description, that doesn't happen. Those people don't survive. They don't survive generation after generation after generation, right? And uh, and that's actually been well-established and and uh, you know, admitted by different uh, scientific bodies and medical bodies that there is no such thing as, a, as an essential carbohydrate. You do not have to consume, uh, you know, plant-based carbohydrates at any point 
during your life or honey at any point during your life. There are entire uh, cultures and civilizations that don't eat any and, uh, and have no deleterious health effects. And so that's not my words, that's theirs. And so you don't need any of that crap. Um, and I, I think you don't want it, honestly. All right. John Albert, 199. Thank you. Wow, we're approaching 1,200 people on here. This is awesome. Oh, wow. Dr. Chafee, I know carnivores don't need any sleep or anything. Are you still good to go for a while and get through some more of these? Yeah, yeah, no, fine, man. Yeah, let's do it. John Albert, also, uh, what supplements should a carnivore take and what processed meats are okay? Oh, you, you you really don't need supplements on a carnivore diet. Like if you have to take supplements and by definition, your diet is deficient, right? You're not getting what you need from your diet right now. We're not eating woolly mammoth or wild horses or all that sort of stuff. You know, the, and the, and the meat that we're eating isn't as nutritious as it could be. Like if you get a cow that's on a regeneratively raised farm, grass fed, grass finished, it is going to have much more nutrients, four or five times the amount of uh, vitamins and minerals that you'll get in, uh, you know, Safeway beef. But Safeway beef is, is, uh, absolutely has an abundance of, of nutrients for the vast majority of people. Some people need a bit more. Some people will metabolize things in different ways, you know, so maybe they may not um, be able to process folate as well. And so maybe they need to eat a bit of liver. That's a supplement for carnivores is liver. I don't think that's a mainstay of your meal, of your diet. I think that that's a supplement. You have some liver and some organs here and there, you know, sort of keep things, you know, topped up. Uh, but otherwise you don't need it. I've checked my bloods after not eating any organs for years and only eating meat for years, they were all in optimal ranges. And so I didn't have any problems. Most people don't have any problems just on Safeway beef, Costco beef, things like that. If you are one of these people, you know, check your folate, check your B12, check your magnesium. Uh, you want to do your erythrocyte magnesium, erythrocyte zinc, erythrocyte folate. It's better. It looks at the levels in your cells, which is where these things are active. It's not as, it's not as useful looking at your serum levels. And you know, if those are all good, then great. You don't need to worry about anything. If they are, you know, lower than they should be or low normal or whatever, you might need to just add in a bit of uh, liver, you know, once or twice a week. It doesn't have to be much. Processed meats, processed meats, again, what are they processed with? It's not more meat. It's just a bunch of plants and sugar and artificial ingredients. So if you have processed meat and ground beef is processed meat, right? But there's nothing added to it. So that's, there's no issues. Um, bacon, you just look at the ingredients list, right? So if it has a long ingredients list with a bunch of words that you can't pronounce, don't get it, right? If it's something that has sort of few, maybe it has some, you know, bit of sugar, a bit of this or whatever. Okay. You know, it's not ideal, but you know, generally the amount of sugar that's sort of in bacon, you know, it's a bit of in the cure and you look at, you know, it's less than, you know, one gram per serving and all that sort of stuff. You know, it's, um, you just want to get it as clean as possible. So, you know, the meat part of the processed meat is not the problem. It's whatever else is in it. So just look at the ingredients list. If it has a big, long, horrible ingredients list, don't get it. Uh, a lot of the processed meats, that's what, look, if that's what you can afford, um, then, you know, get it. You know, it's better than, it's better than the alternative anyway. Um, but if you look at the ingredients quite often in sort of like sausages or like summer sausages or bologna or these sorts of things, you look at the ingredients list and it'll say, you know, 75%, you know, pork or something like that. And it'll do the other thing. Okay. What does that mean? That means that 25% of it is not animal, right? So 25% of this is, is plant-based starch and fillers and, and garbage like that, which are cheaper. And that's why they put all that stuff in it. And so if, if you have that where it's just like, 67%, whatever is like, okay, so that means that there's a lot of other stuff in here that I don't want. So I just, I would just sort of just check the ingredients list and try to go for the ones that have as few ingredients as possible. And hopefully ones that you recognize and can pronounce. All right. The gram, I have Achilles tendonitis. Can I expect my ribeye tonight to cure this tonight? I'll have it no matter <laughs> what. I can answer that. Yes. Next question. <laughs> <laughs> Carnivores don't get Achilles tendonitis either. I'm pretty sure on that one, but yeah, I'm pretty sure. Be. Yeah, there must be something else with that with that with that ribeye. If you have Achilles tendonitis, I think that's it. Right. You're showing your your card, but uh, yeah, no, of course, I think you know that's a that's a yeah tongue in cheek sort of thing. Uh, yeah, no, of course that's not gonna not gonna cure it tonight. But you know, you you reduce inflammation, 
and uh, that can significantly help reduce the pain and the symptoms that you have. Ketones, just having higher ketones directly suppresses inflammation. Not eating a lot of other things that cause inflammation also reduce the, the body of inflammation that you have. And so people do find that they have much less pain as a result of that, which is great. So, you know, take it easy, you know, rehab it properly, but yeah, you can expect to heal faster on a carnivore diet than, than you would have otherwise. Absolutely. Speaking of inflammation, just real quick, I had this guy come into the theater the other day, Shane, he was like, mm -hmm. you're not going to believe this. I've only been doing carnivore for like three weeks and I've had back pain for decades and it's completely mm -hmm. gone. It's like inflammation. It, I, yeah. So many people are walking around with inflammation. And I, I say it a lot on my channel, but you need to know what it's like to live without inflammation. I had back pain for years too. And I always thought it was, oh, this is just the way it is. I must have injured myself at some point and it's just always going to be that way. Three weeks on carnivore, yeah. no more back pain ever again. It's amazing. Yeah, that's great. Jessica, day 32 on carnivore diet. Is it possible to eat too much protein in a meal? Already eating four eggs, two seven-ounce burgers for breakfast, 12-ounce steak for dinner, plus butter. Still not feeling satiated. Thank you, Dr. Chafee, for all you do. Um, you know, you know what's what's too much? It's sort of the thing is, is you know, how how long is a piece of string? You know, it varies, right? So it's different for different people. Um, you know, the 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 thing about eating too much on a carnivore diet is it's very difficult. Your body stops enjoying it very quickly. If you're eating a lot of lean meat and you're getting a lot more protein than fat and your body wants the fat, that it's going to stop tasting good, you know, and you're still going to be like, hmm, I still want to eat. I don't want to eat that. And all of a sudden you add some butter to it, add some fat to it. You go, okay, I like that again. That's good now because your, your body's saying, okay, yes, we want those nutrients. We don't need those as much. We have enough of those. And so if you're eating those sorts of things and that's not enough, then you need to eat more. Pretty simple. And so, you know, some people will say that you can only absorb a certain amount of protein, like 40 grams of protein a day. Um, to me, that doesn't even pass a smell test, you know, because like you, you get a lion that's taking down a gazelle once a week, right? So they're only getting 40 grams of, of protein or however much a, you know, a lion gets, but then all that, you know, that's just six pounds of gazelle is just just pooping out probably not right so they're absorbing that and you and you can you can see this too very clearly you know in your in your own uh in your own ways is that you're not going to be you know eliminating this out you know if you eat a kilo of steak right you know two pounds two and a half pounds of meat right or sometimes when i'm working out i'll eat like four to five pounds of meat in a day and it's very easy to put on muscle then when I'm working out and I'm eating that much and my body's asking me to eat that much because that's how much it's wanting. And, you know, that's not just coming out the next day. I absorb that. I absorb all of that. And so, you know, that doesn't really work. If I'm, if I'm eating once a day and I'm eating hundreds of grams, you know, how do you put on muscle if you're only going to absorb 40 grams? I'm 240 pounds. And so I'm eating once a day and I'm putting on muscle regularly and i'm certainly not wasting away you know and i'm only getting 40 grams a day well clearly not I'm, I'm clearly absorbing a lot more of that and animals in the wild do too predators carnivores they they eat infrequently generally they don't necessarily eat every day smaller animals may be getting a whole bunch of little lizards and insects and bugs and things like that big prey animals tend to like take down a big piece of game, you know, like a poker player, they take down one big pot an hour or something like that. And that's, that's sort of what they have to average. Um, that's like, that's like us. That's like lions. That's like, you know, cheetahs and things like that. They have to take down, you know, one big thing every few days or once a week or something like that. And that's how they work. And they need to get everything out of that, you know, in, in that session from eating that thing in that time to last them another week. So, you know, no, I think, I think you uh, are fine. You're not going to hurt yourself anyway by, by eating more protein, it's just, it's just going to taste bad, you know? So keep eating until meat stops tasting good. Fatty meats, so you're eating fatty meat and you're getting the fat with the meat, aim for about gram for gram and, uh, and then adjust from there based on your own, your own, uh, you know, your own body. But, um, it's, uh, yeah, you just need to keep eating until meat stops tasting good. Fatty meat stops tasting good. Your body knows what it's doing. Your body is much more, uh, in tune and in touch than, than any so-called expert, you know, you, anybody has a formula or a calculator or whatever, 
it should not be trusted because like the formula to figure out our biochemistry is about 38 miles long in small print, right? So you're not gonna figure that out. No one's gonna figure that out to, to exacting degrees. No one's gonna figure it out as much as your body already knows it. So if you stay out of your body's way, you don't disrupt your, your, your biochemistry by eating things that you shouldn't and you're only eating fatty meat, your body will tell you what to do and your body will figure everything out. Yes, listen to your body. Brett Atwood, $20, just a little money for the documentary. I want to thank Dr. Chafee for how committed he has been to shout from the rooftops. Everyone deserves to feel this good. Down 90 pounds, reverse type 2 diabetes, nice. and so many other wins. Amazing. Yeah. Anyone who's watching this from my channel, please go make sure you're subscribed to Dr. Chafee. We need to elevate more voices like his for sure. And thank you, Brett, so much for the donation for the documentary. We need it. We're going to reach more bills because of it. So I really appreciate that. Candy and Sean, uh, $5. Thank you so much. Stacy says, no colon, J pouch patient, a few months on carnivore, no more pain. Labs are great. Nice. Hemoglobin highest it's ever been. Will I still need iron B12 supplements forever because of no colon? Oh, no, not, not because of no colon. You, you absorb B12 in your, in your small intestine. So before you get to the colon, so if you if you still have the majority of your small intestine, you, you should be fine. Now that doesn't mean that you don't have other problems, you know, upstream that are going to interrupt that. If you had damage to your to your stomach, you can get pernicious anemia. It's an autoimmune issue. Or if you had surgery damage and took out the part of your stomach that made intrinsic factor, intrinsic factor needs to be released from your stomach and bind to B twelve, and then you absorb it in your in your distal um, ileum, I believe. And uh, it's been a long since <laughs> times I looked at that. But anyway, your small intestine. And so, you know, it goes down there and absorbs there, but it needs to be bound to intrinsic factors. So if you're not making that anymore, you're not releasing that or that part of your, your stomach was taken out or damaged, then you, you may not be able to do that. Um, iron, you should be you should be able to uh, absorb pretty well. Heme iron is obviously much more bioavailable than uh, any other source of iron. And that's what you're getting with, with meat, especially red meat, and you're getting the myoglobin and things like that. Um, you know, so drink those juices and, um, yeah, and that, and that should be fine. You know, other thing, I mean, it's, it's sort of gross, but I mean, like, you know, ma the Maasai drink blood and that's going to be the, your, your best uh, available source of iron, um, there because it's just tons and tons and tons of hemoglobin. And that's, um, that's what your body needs it for anyway. So, uh, yeah, that, that's awesome. I'm really glad that you're doing so well. I'm glad your labs are great. Uh, you just need to keep checking, you know, your, your nutrients and things like that. Most of your nutrients will be absorbed in your small intestine. So if you still have most of that, you should be you should be fine. And meat is the most bioavailable nutrient source that there is. And so, but you know, there's there's obviously more to your story there. So um, just keep checking. And if you you check your your bloods and your um, you know minerals and vitamins every three months or so, and it's consistently in good areas. Um, you know, and you, and you, you want to try coming off supplements or whatever, and you, and you maintain those levels, um, without that, then that's great. Then you, you can come off of that, but you need to test it. You know, you need to test your levels and you need to test what your body does when you come off supplements and you try that. And if it's coming down and too low, then, then unfortunately you'll need to, to stay on, but hopefully, hopefully you don't need to. Carnivorous dude, $1. Thank you so much. Molly Malone, $5. Carnivorous dude, my mom has an ulcer in her colon and is worried about red meat. Hmm. Um, yeah, I, I wonder what the what the ulcers caused from. Is that like an autoimmune condition or some sort of an infection or 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 what? You know, it, people have ulcerative colitis. You know, that would need a biopsy to sort of diagnose that. If that's the case, that will respond extraordinarily well to a a red meat and water diet. Most autoimmune issues respond extraordinarily well. To elimination diets. There was actually a study with Crohn's disease patients who, um, you know, were having, you know, very, were very symptomatic and having flare ups, you know, 20, 30 um, bouts of bloody diarrhea a day. And that's typical for, for Crohn's sufferers in a, in a bad flare up. And they found that putting people on an elemental diet, which is just a very highly processed sort of shake with all the different nutrients and things like that that you need. And, and, and um, I've spoken to people that actually prefer the ones that, that are for keto. Uh, the keto ones for epilepsy, um, and they do better on those. That um, the ones I've spoken to do better on those. So it's just the nutrients you need, nothing you don't need, right? That's what a steak is, right? And so 
they found that putting people on elemental diet was a better treatment for an acute attack of Crohn's disease than prednisone, right? Or prednisolone if you're you know, outside of the US. That is crazy. That's the gold standard. That's a major, major, major immune blocker that just absolutely suppresses the immune function and should just stop your body from being able to attack anything, let alone your intestines, right? And it was a better treatment to just not eat garbage, right? So you just cut that crap out of your system and that was better treatment than steroids, right? So if your mom has like a, you know, some, well, immune issues will improve in a lot of ways. Autoimmune issues improve. We do see studies with, with ulcerative, with uh, Crohn's, which is, uh, you know, akin to ulcerative colitis. And, uh, and people do very, very well on ulcerative colitis uh, as well with these sorts of treatments and interventions as well. Um, yeah, I mean, people people get worried about red meat. We're, we're told by our doctors we should be worried about red meat, especially with bowel issues. But, you know, going back to, you know, earlier with the whole idea about colon cancer and colon disease and all this stuff, it is absolutely not borne out by the evidence. It is simply not borne out by the data in the literature. The data in the literature shows that meat is healthy. Red meat in particular is very healthy. There's absolutely no association in any well-designed, high-level study between red meat or meat in general and, and any sort of disease at all whatsoever, full stop. Blanco, uh, 2,500. I think that's Argentinian. Thank you. And then there's a question. Nice. A little Thank bit you, more. sir. Linda, $2. Thank you. Brett's a new member. Awesome. And then Blanco's question, forgot the question. Can I be on top <laughs> health drinking whole milk? I'm very tolerant to it. And my thinking is there's an extensive historical evidence that it is good. Like you said, the Ethiopians described by Herodotus are most known the Indo-European conquerors. Yeah. Uh, it, well, it depends. You're tolerant of it. That's good. Uh, you know, the Maasai drink a whole bunch of this stuff. Raw milk is a very different creature to, you know, pasteurized homogenized milk, very different things. And so, you know, if you're getting grass fed raw milk, whole, raw whole milk, milk on pa on pasteurized on, on, you know, not homogenized milk, then, um, then that's different. Um, I do think that, that milk, because of its lactose content is, is, a, a you know, a bit problematic, you know, it, it's going to increase your insulin and your blood sugar, and you're going to kick yourself out of, of a uh, metabolic state that you want to be in. So as a treat every now and then, you know, great, the Maasai do great with it. So, I mean, you can, you can certainly be very healthy drinking raw whole milk. Um, if you're just drinking normal whole milk, you know, you'll see a lot of people who drink a lot of milk. You're just you're just jacking up your insulin, and um, and you can have sort of inflammation. People can put on on weight as well, and so that's just something to think about. Um, but you know, if you like that, I would just sort of you know maybe you know maybe just have it occasionally, and uh, and try to reduce the amount of like, total carbs you're coming in. The Maasai as well. There was a study, uh, which was actually a great study, looking between um, the Maasai and the Akikuyu that were like the bordering, uh, you know, tribes and people, and they're actually largely plant-based. So they're they're eating just sort of you know just whole food plant-based diet, you know, all these different things that they grow and they find largely you know not as much meat. The Maasai eating mostly meat, mostly dairy, mostly blood from their cattle, if not exclusively, and. And they found that the, the Maasai were much, much healthier. So on average, five inches taller, larger brains, better teeth, uh, 23 pounds heavier on average. And they're just lean. These guys are just you know, jet skinny, you know, and 50% um, and, uh, stronger, right? And they weren't getting diabetes and all these different chronic diseases and, you know, lung infections and tropical ulcers and all these sorts of other things. And, and uh, they weren't anemic. You know, the Akikuyu were anemic. And, uh, and had a lot of vitamin deficiencies. And they, they tried to correct the vitamin deficiencies and they found that their health actually didn't improve. It wasn't until they actually you know, reduced the amount of plants they were eating and started giving them meat that their health actually improved. Obviously, they didn't just grow five inches after that, but you know, they, they did improve their health. Now, one thing that they did find in the, in the, um, the Maasai was that you know, they didn't have arthritis, but they had more like... Um, like uh, rheumatoid factor. 
So that there's some sort of inflammatory sort of process that you have this sort of factor that starts coming up and, and is strongly associated with rheumatoid arthritis. Now, it's not, it's not a one-to-one. Um, if you have that, you just have more of a chance, you know, of getting it. But it doesn't seem that they like fully develop arthritis, but it does seem to, to raise a bit of that inflammation um, that we can see in, in autoimmunity such as rheumatoid arthritis. Um, so that's just something to think about. The casein can be pro-inflammatory. The A1 protein is, uh, you know, most people find that it's quite inflammatory. A2 is less inflammatory, but upper where there's less, not, not inflammatory. So it is still inflammatory. It's just less inflammatory. You, you're going to have to make a you know judgment call for, for yourself. If that's something that you like, you're staying lean, slim, and, tr- and strong, you know, fine. You know, kids who drink more dairy or have more dairy on average grow taller and have, uh, you know, better bone density. Um, would they be as good just eating meat? Probably, maybe even better. But um, for me, I I don't drink a lot of milk. Every now and then when I get my hands on some raw milk, like I drink the hell out of that. It's illegal in, in Australia, so that, that's just not really happening every now and then. It's hard to get in America, uh, but it's delicious. And, uh, and, but I also think of that as a bit of a problem because I don't, I don't want to be like craving something. I don't want to be like, Oh my God, I want that. You know, I want to have my, you know, my, my life to myself and just eat meat when I'm hungry and then just get on with my life. And if something's causing me to have cravings, I think it's probably not a great thing. So for me, I tend to avoid that. Um, what I recommend to people is, is probably best to avoid milk, even, you know, raw, uh, whole milk just because of the, the carbs. You know, you're going to start bringing up your insulin. You're going to, you know, raise your blood sugar. You're going to raise your insulin and you're going to disrupt your normal hormonal and metabolic functioning. So for me, it's a, it's a treat every now and then, but certainly not something I would do on a regular basis. All right. Well, I think you kind of just covered this question. I don't know if you want to add anything, uh, Dr. Pepper. Yeah. Well, also just, um, yeah, well just dairy in general, if it's, if it's, you know, um, uh, you know, raw is much better than, than the rest. Right. Um, and, uh, dairy that's been fermented and has that carbohydrates taken away, uh, much better, you know, and you're, and you're going to get some of those, those live culture bacteria and things like that, which can be good. You know, if you're just eating meat, you're going to have a very healthy gut bacteria, uh, as we see in studies with the Inuit, you know, that just eat meat, they have really, really good gut biota. And, um, you know, but I was just saying, just a, another thought that I had about the, you know, the last one is sort of, you know, thinking about, you know, our ancestors and things like that, that, that ate milk. We, we haven't really been, been using dairy for all that long. So not going back past the last ice age, um, we don't think, you know, so it, it is more of a new adaptation, probably because the megafauna died off and we, we don't have these big, large fatty animals, larger the animals have more fat and then we really do need the fat. And so we, we probably started cultivating, you know, dairy animals in order to get more fat and, uh, and have a, a more of an access to, to fatty, uh, fatty acids. But, um, either way, I think it's, it's probably not ideal if you have access to big fatty steaks, which you should do in Argentina. That's like, that's just steak Graceland, really. Jen S, uh, $1.99, thank you. Uh, name redacted, $5. What are your thoughts on lean mass hyper responders? Should they be concerned about high LDL? No, I I, I don't think so. Um, I Again, I just don't, I just don't think that, um, that LDL and all these sorts of things were, were the issue that, we've uh, been told that it was. So, you know, there's, there's a guy, uh, you know, uh, Dave Feldman, who's doing a ton of research in this. And, um, you know, so it's, um, you know, it's, it's, it's worthwhile, you know, looking at his research on the subject, but, you know, when, when you look at just LDL in general, it was, it was a con, you know, and a lot of these things have now been shown to be a con. And there are more and more large, very well-designed, high-level studies that are showing that 
higher LDL is not an issue. And there are randomized controlled trials with thousands of people, sometimes tens of thousands of people showing that you, you intervene, you give somebody unsaturated fat and you lower their LDL cholesterol. And then what happens, they start dying of heart attacks and strokes, right? Not a great, great outcome, right? So am I worried about high LDL? No, it means you're going to live longer on average, right? Um, also, your LDL fluctuates quite wildly early on. And so I never check um, or I never, I never pay attention to or I don't want to check uh, uh, cholesterol within the first six months. A lot of things, a lot of weird things are going to happen there. After about six months, things, things to start to settle down a bit. Your LDL is going to be a bit higher or it could be low or it could be normal. You know, you want it to be at least in the normal range, probably even a bit of a, of a higher range, um, according to various studies that show that people live longer and get less, <laughs> get less heart disease and strokes and, and cancer and things like that and infectious disease. So a lot of, a lot of associations with higher LDL that are actually very positive in a number of different studies. So, and then you look at the, uh, familial hypercholesterolemia patients are like, Oh my God, these people die more. Not really. In the earlier decades of life, they have a higher risk of, uh, you know, uh, cardiovascular disease, death from cardiovascular disease. Sure. Um, and then after about, you know, age 50, it's even, right? So they have, they have the same, um, you know, uh, die off rate after that. And after 70, it's actually lower. They have lower rates of, of uh, cardiovascular disease and death. Uh, so what's going on there? Well, they seem to also have other genetic issues, right? So they found that people with, with familial high cholesterol that, you know, as a genetic issue, that they also are more likely to have a gene that makes them clot more easily. So what is a heart attack? What is a stroke? It's a clot where it's not supposed to be, right? You block off blood supply. And that part of the of the body dies, right? If it's an important part, that's a big deal. And so that's what a heart attack and a stroke is. And so when they differentiated out that, people with they just have massively elevated um, genetic reasons for having high uh, cholesterol. And the people that had the high cholesterol but also had the clotting factor, it was only those with the clotting factor that had increased risk of heart disease. So just having massively elevated cholesterol did not increase your risk for heart disease um, compared to the rest of the population. So, yeah, it's it, I, it's literally LDL is is probably my least concern as a doctor. I I I can't think of much else that I just care less about. Yeah. All right. Crigamus, dollar ninety nine. Crigamus, dollar ninety nine. Thank you, thank you. Carnivore today. This is my good friend Adam. Five dollars. Thank you. Love this comment too. Everyone should check out Carnivore today. He's been volunteering his time to help me with the documentary movie. He's been awesome. Oh, nice. Who would pay good? I would. I would. Who would pay good money to see Dr. Chafee play a rugby match against a team of Kellogg's and Pfizer execs? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that a little. That would be amazing. Oh my God, that'd be fun. Just tee off on those. Those guys, oh, that'd be great. Miguel Ortiz, ten dollars. When will the bile poop stop? Eight weeks in on meat and dairy only. <laughs> no bile if I start my meal with dairy? Question mark. Also, any tip for food that I can take on mm. a thirty-plus mile bike ride? Thank you both for all you do. Um. Yeah. Well, that's it. So I don't, I don't know exactly what you mean by bile poop. Maybe it's sort of greenish. Or um, I don't know if you you mean. Um, Maybe you're having diarrhea or something like that. If it's diarrhea, it's, it's more fat than your body can absorb, or you're still drinking coffee or your tea or using artificial sweeteners. All of those are, are laxatives, right? So if you're only eating meat, only drinking water, you know, you should have normal stools. Dairy can actually make you constipated. That can actually harden things up, even if you're already eating a lot of uh, fat. So it's a, it's a bit of a weird one there, but um, no bile if I start my meal with dairy. That's interesting. I, I don't know if you're talking about, I, you know, it sounds like you're talking about having like sort of green bile in your, in your stools, which is not typical. I haven't really, I haven't really seen that before, but whatever, whatever you do, if you if you sort of eat something in a certain way and you're not having the problems that you're, that you're worried about, just do it that way. You know, there's so many things in medicine that we don't really know exactly what's going on. And, um, and it doesn't really matter because it's sort of the solution is still 
you know, right there in front of your front of you, you know, people say it's like, oh, well, you know, it hurts when I do this. Okay, well, stop doing that. You know, <laughs> like then it, you know, problem solved. Um, and so that's the thing here. So if you're not having that problem, if you if you start a meal with dairy or, or something like that, you know, great. You know, just just do it like that. Um, tips for a bike ride. You know, the thing is, is that you know uh, a lot of uh, you know long distance endurance, you know, athletes and cyclists and things like that aren't eating at all. You know, they're 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 going fasted. They're just drinking water, and you feel fine. You'll you'll be fine. You know, if you're just eating meat and and just drinking water, you have plenty of fat stores. That is your food. That's that's what you're you're carrying with you. That is your larder, right? And so you know you'll be you'll be fine on a thirty mile ride as long as you're eating enough prior to that. As long as you're eating enough in the days leading up to that, and just in general you're healthy and you have a lot of healthy weight on you, you'll be fine. The things that you may want to eat if you're if you feel like doing that, you don't. First of all, you don't generally don't need refeeds. There's a lot of cyclists like uh, you know Sean Seiko. Um, Sapanowski, who's um, uh, in South Africa, and he works with uh, the Nopes Foundation, and he's you know high level elite cyclist, and he just does carnivore. He's been doing keto for years, and he's doing just full carnivore now, and he does two hundred uh, you know k cycles and things like that. You know, at competitive sort of races, you know, finished top five in one. It was like in Jordan, so it's like just crazy heat. And you know, 200 kilometers, and he's you know he's uh, his 50s, and so and he finished in uh, I think fifth, you know. So that that was actually quite a big result. He ate nothing the entire time. Everyone else is like, oh my god, god. I'm dying. And they pace cars around them, you know, giving them a bunch of like sugary snacks and refeed things. They're just sucking it down. They're like dying, and he's just like, okay, yeah, I'm fine. And he just kept going, and. Um, but if you wanted something, you just want animal stuff. So pemmican is amazing. That's just the, that's what the Native Americans used to eat. They used to be the iron rations in a lot of armies throughout you know, history, and that's just you know ground up, dried, powdered meat mixed with liquid tallow, and um, and you just sort of mix that up, you let it dry and harden. You just sort of eat that. Or if you just want you know sort of the energy or whatever, again you'll have more than enough energy. Um, you can just bring the tallow. You can just bring a sort of a slurpy pack full of, uh, you know, sort of tallow. You have to sort of warm up and you just sort of slurp that down. You'll just get, you know, a few hundred calories, you know, right there, you know, if not, you know, over a thousand. So, you know, that is, um, that's the sort of thing that, that I would do. Um, but yeah, I don't think, I don't, I really don't think you, you would actually need it. It's sort of weird to think about, but once you get, you know, adapted, you know, your system gets adapted to running on fat, you'll find that you probably don't need that at all. Tanya, thank you for the priceless information, life-changing from Northern Ireland. Thank you. Oh, awesome. Well, thank you, Tanya. I appreciate that. Michelle says, hi, I'm 45 years old and been on carnivore diet since the 7th of July and have bursitis in the hip. Would that go away on carnivore? Well, you know, it, it's it's – one of those things that it uh, can help significantly, and you know, like we were talking about earlier, people with it, that significantly reduce their pain by reducing the inflammation it can definitely help. That you know, it may not it may not completely fix your bursitis, but it it should reduce your your pain and your symptoms. And uh, and in a lot of people, it can get rid of it. If it gets rid of all of it for you, then that's that, that's amazing. I can't say for sure. There's a lot of other things that are going on that contribute to these things, but it will reduce your uh, inflammation significantly and that can reduce the amount of pain that you're feeling and and you know bursitis is just the inflammation and uh, you know swelling and irritation of uh, one of your bursa sacs right so you know if that is reducing that inflammation and your your body sort of working a bit better it can hopefully heal that but you know some of these sort of you know chronic issues that you've had for a long time some of those things you know tend to linger but uh, there's a good chance that it will help significantly and and could get rid of it but sort of only time will tell with that one all right one hope for all i don't eat organ meat but i do have grass-fed beef liver 4500 mg supplement is that good to have if you're not eating the actual organ meats you, you may not even need to eat that honestly so you know it's um the 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 supplement is going to be more expensive than just getting some beef liver you know just having some liver every now and then um, if you cook it right, you sort of, I, I sort of just sort of sear the outside and leave the inside pretty much raw tastes 
so much better like that. And, um, and so it's, it's actually not that bad, but, um, you know, I, I rarely use liver and if I do, it's just sort of, ah, okay, why not? Um, but you know, if you're, if you're one of those that, you know, you're, you're checking your bloods and you, you need a bit more folate or you need a bit more of this or that, um, it, it's a good idea just to, just to eat liver, you know, just have a bit of that and just learn how to cook it in a way that, that you like it. Um, but most people don't need to eat liver or take supplements. Um, and, uh, you know, if you just really don't want to eat liver and, and you are one of those people who need a bit more, you know, folate or whatever, and, and you just, you just really can't, can't handle that, then sure. You know, having that supplement, you know, should be fine. Um, but I think it's, it's best to do it just getting with the liver. It's cheaper for you too, you know? And so, uh, that's, that's, that's what I would suggest anyway. All right. I'm going to mess this name. I'm Kareem. I uh, just received a reaction on Instagram. Well, this is a good one. Pesticides concentrate mm -hmm. and accumulate in the meat of animals anywhere from 20 times to 100 times the amount that's on produce. Can you please debunk this for me? Yeah. I mean, do they? What, what's the evidence for that? You know, I mean, did they provide a study or anything like that? Or are they just, just making that claim? You know, it's like there's people that, that claim that, you know, when the ice ages, when the ice sheets came down, that people moved towards the equator. They've literally just made that shit up. So it's like, you know, it's like, okay, what's your evidence for that? Uh, so ask them, you know, any, anytime someone puts someone forward like that is just like, okay, can you, can you produce a scientific article that, that shows that, you know? Um, and, uh, and, and, and fine. Okay. So, so how much, you know, in, in one steak and three ounces and what, what are we talking about? hundred times in the whole cow. Okay. Well then it's nothing. You don't care about that. Right. So, you know, and also ruminant animals are actually really good at, uh, destroying pesticides and other sorts of things. There was actually a, a recent, um, uh, study that came out that talking about glyphosate, so Roundup, and uh, ruminant animals apparently can just you know burn through that stuff, never absorb it in the first place. So you know this is this is this could also be an argument for why um, you know monogastrics like chickens, pig, fish, if they're farmed or being fed you know garbage, that 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 some people have problems with that, right? And they don't have as much problems with red meat ruminant animals, right? Because they, you know, the monogasters aren't going to be able to eliminate this stuff out. And so it's not just the pesticides. First of all, there are 10,000 times more naturally occurring pesticides and insecticides in the plant itself by weight, right? So the plants are worse than the pesticides. So pesticides aren't really an issue. If you're eating the plants or the animals eating the plants, it's not able to detoxify the plants uh, well enough. That's the problem. It's not the pesticides. And, um, and, uh, those same pesticides when compared to this, uh, an equivocal amount of pesticides will be sprayed on, um, you know, like a serving of like, you know, mushrooms or compared it to mushrooms, the mushrooms were 500 times more likely to cause cancer than the pesticides that, that we used on them. Okay. So, you know, ask them for their sources, make sure they're not just completely full of shit. Um, you know, saying uh, what, what we're talking here is that per three ounces, 20 times the amount that's on the produce. Is it, is it though, you know, and, and for how much, so you have a, like a three ounce piece of meat and that's going to have 20 times the amount of pesticide that's going to be on three ounces of spinach. I doubt it, you know, but you know, if it is tell them to back it up and uh, also ruminants, um, likely won't have that issue anyway, but I, 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 I suspect this guy's completely full of shit, honestly. Molly Malone, $2. Stacy Shearer, following up, I was simply a UC patient, uh, colitis patient who ended up with a J pouch. Now I have Crohn's. Mm -hmm. Carnivore to the rescue. Thank you, Dr. Anthony Chafee. I feel you've given me my life back. Oh, good. Yeah, that will go away. I'm sorry that, that you had to get your colon taken away uh, before you found this um, with your ulcerative colitis because that, that would have gone away too. It's, it's from the food that we're eating that is causing these diseases, especially for things like ulcerative colitis and Crohn's and other autoimmune issues. Um, but, you know, the good news is you have your J pouch and now you know how to protect it. You know, get rid of all plants. You need to be very, very strict. You know, when, when people have these sort of roaring autoimmune issues, you need to be more strict than, than other people. So you need to be really, really just really just red meat and water. Like that's it. And grass finished red meat and water 
if you can get it. Um, you might just be just fine with, uh, you know, grain finished. But if it's if it's still causing you a bit of problem, then, you know, you know, grass grass fed and finished is your is your holy grail. That's amazing, too. Like, how does that feel, Dr. Chafee, getting a comment from Stacy? I feel you've given me my life back. I'm sure you get yeah, many comments good. like that fire you up or what? Jeez. No, it's amazing. And it's, um, you know, I mean, it's, 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 it's why, you know, this is, this is, you know, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of stuff that goes into this. It's a lot of dealing with, um, you know, you know, assholes and idiots and, uh, you know, that's not always fun, but, um, you know, but that, that's why you do it, you know, because you, you reach people like that and you can, and you can just, just impart this knowledge. This is like, this is, this is available for people, but they just, they just don't know it because they're not being told that their doctors don't know it often. And they're not, and they're not telling it if they do, because they're just so used to just, you know, pushing out pills and like, oh, that's en not enough. So let's just chop out, you know, whatever the hell it is. And I just, I just don't agree with that. I don't think that's the right way to do it. I think that's a bastardization um, and corruption of medicine. You know, medicine is, is, a, is a beautiful profession. It's a, it's a, it's a amazing um, application of science and it's been completely corrupted and taken over. And I, I want it back. You know, th these are not the reasons that I got into medicine. These are not the reasons that I, as a kid was interested in, in being a doctor. It's absolutely not it. You know, I was interested in being a doctor to actually help people and to get them better and to you know, help them, you know, if they're, they had an accident or something happened or whatever, you were there to help them and you could help fix them and say, Hey, dude, this is what's going on. Let's fix this. Now it's just, here's a problem. Here's a pill. And that's how people are trained. You know, pills aren't working. Okay. Let's chop it out. No, that is wrong. That's not what we've been doing for thousands of years. And that's not that this really not what we've been doing for, um, you know, even, you know, more than, you know, really 50 years before that we had much better medicine and people understood diet and nutrition better than they do now before it was utterly corrupted. And, you know, there, there were much less chronic diseases. So we were, we were treating accidents and emergencies and childbirth and all these other sorts of things that we, that we could actually help with. And now it's just 90% of what we do is just chronic diseases that do not need to exist. None of them need to exist. You just stop eating things that are inappropriate for your biology. They will go away, right? You can have other exposures as well, and that can be a problem. The vast majority of the things are coming from what we're eating. If you just eat what your body is designed to eat, it will work the way it's designed to work. And most of these problems will go away. The vast majority of these problems will go away. And... You know, I, I just don't think it's okay um, for people to profit off, you know, uh, people suffering. I just, I just think it's sick. And so, you know, I want people to be healthy. I want them to be able to, to know what they need to know so they can just be healthy on their own. You can have these, you know, little trolls and things like that in the comments. Who gives a shit? You know, they're just not going to get it, you know? Like more meat for us. Like if they don't want to help their health, if they don't want to have an open mind and go like, okay, well, maybe I'll try it and go, holy shit, I'm coming off medications and I'm helping myself and I'm feeling better. Maybe I'll look into this more. Or maybe A, look into it more first of all before you talk trash and then, you know, see what you think. But either way, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what they do. That's, that's the whole point is that, you know, when we're at the whim of the of the system, when we're at the whim of the medical establishment, we just go, oh, gosh, I, there's just this thing happening to me and I, I'm talking to my doctor and we just don't know and it's just getting worse. And you're, you're, you're completely out of control. You know, your life is not your own. The you know, direction of your ship is not in your control. You're just in a storm and you're just being whipped around. You have no idea and no control. That's that's really not a nice place to be. So, you know, that's a problem because you're relying on everybody else and everybody else is failing you. And so, you know, being able to just, you know, get that back and have control is, is so empowering. And so it doesn't matter what these people say. It doesn't matter what other doctors say. It doesn't matter because your illnesses are going away. You are coming off of medications. You are getting objectively better by every physical and medical objective marker except LDL, but who gives a shit? And so, you know, and, and it is better. It's just not a better according to people who don't, don't know better. You know, so you're getting better in all these things. It doesn't matter what they think because now this is in your control. You're controlling this. You're doing this. You're getting better, right? You don't need them to get better. Mm -hmm. That's why, they, you know, a lot of people don't like this, you know, because a lot of people have made their fortunes off of you needing them. You don't need them. 
right? And you don't need this guy to agree with you or any of the trolls who agree with you or any you know, idiots say, oh, you're a hundred times the amount of, no, you don't. And even if you did, so what? It's still better than the alternative, right? And just, just you know, get, you know, cows that haven't been given a bunch of pesticide covered crap, you know, grass is fine, right? Mm -hmm. It's preferred. And so, you know, you don't need them to agree with you. You don't need them to be convinced. You don't need any of these people. All you need to do is eat properly and that'll take care of the rest, you know? And we'll have a whole bunch of people around the world, independent, healthy, and strong, knowing that they can live their own life, knowing that they can keep themselves healthy. And that is a powerful force to reckon with. Absolutely. And like for Stacy here too, with colitis and Crohn's, I've known so many people over my life that have had those two things. It's horrible. And just imagine mm. how many people are out there right now suffering from colitis or Crohn's disease that don't even know this is an option yet. That's uh, yeah. That's why we got to get the word out. That's kind of the whole thought behind the, the carnivore yeah. diet movie too, is reach people that are hopeless. They think all they can do is take medication and they're suffering with these things for years and years and it's needless. Uh, Vic, yeah, five dollars, Doctor Chafee. I'm starting my day one of 31 day carnivore challenge today. Your opinion on fish and seafood like nice. shrimp and lobster? I spearfish. Thanks. Oh, yeah, yeah. Get as much as you can, man. Like, it's, you know, any meat's fine. So any any animal flesh is fine. You know, obviously excluding any poison sacs and you know, uh, you know, fugu liver and and things like that. Um, you know, so but but any any sort of normally, you know. Um, eaten meats are, are fine. So whatever whatever you enjoy makes you feel good and uh, that you can afford and have access to, right? So if you do fine with with fish, seafood, and shellfish, then then go for it. You know that's great. And you know if you're a spear fisher, obviously you've been doing this for a while and you presumably enjoy it, and you just find if that if that's helping you and you're feeling good, great. You need fat. A lot of that stuff that you described there are um, not all, all that fatty, depending on the kind of fish that you're getting, uh, add butter. Basically, most people do fine with butter. Uh, if you have autoimmune issues, you know, maybe you have to be careful, maybe some grass fed tallow or something like that, but you need, you need fat. Just remember you do need fat. And, um, yeah, so, so go to town on that and, uh, just add butter, grass fed butter. Be great. All right. Canada is a corp $5. Good day. Thank you for sharing your knowledge. My grandson has cerebral palsy. Is there any mm -hmm. indications regarding carnivore and recovery on any basis? So uh, uh, only anecdotal, you know, uh, for cerebral palsy. Now, there are, uh, there are studies showing that uh, ketogenic diets improve outcomes and healing and recovery from like traumatic brain injuries. And other sort of damage you get from like you know, strokes and things like that. Okay, so that that is shown in the in the peer reviewed literature, um, and so you can sort of extrapolate that to other sort of damaged areas of the nervous system. Right, cerebral palsy is generally a stable lesion, you know, that's th present at birth that doesn't get better or worse over time. That's that's how it's described, sort of as a, as a loose definition from the textbooks. Um, However, I have seen people, I had a guy on, on my podcast, uh, uh, David Mack, who had a stroke 30 years ago, even did keto, even did Atkins, did all these different sorts of, sorts of different sorts of things. And he had weakness down his right side, pretty stable for 30 years. And, but he was quite weak and had difficulty walking, had difficulty going up and down stairs, very bad balance issues. Two months on a carnivore diet, his wife was saying, like, hey, you're walking different. You're walking like normal. He's like, wait, what, Really? videotaping he's like oh my god you're right this is crazy all of a sudden he's running up and down stairs he doesn't have any balance issues he doesn't have any problems going up and down stairs 30 years after he's had a stroke and damage to his brain that should be permanent that should be 100 permanent apparently he was able to recover um there are a lot of things there's uh, bdnf is a brain derived neurotropic factor that improve that increases with ketones more ketones more bdnf and uh, exercise can help that as well so that can cause you know, healing and structure and regrowth and uh, and and new connections um, from your brain tissue. You have exactly the same amount of nerve cells. If they have more connections, your brain works better. That's how that works. So um, there's potential there. I have spoken to one person who has cerebral palsy, and they seem to think that their neurological issues were improving. 
So that's just one person that's just told me their story. And, you know, I don't know anything else, but it's, it's promising. And either way, it's going to help in a thousand different ways. It's going to definitely be, be beneficial in a lot of other ways. It can help maximize his neurological development and uh, maximize, you know, everything outside of that lesion. Can it fix that lesion? It's probably not going to fix it all the way. Could it help mitigate some of the problems? Absolutely. Could it help reverse some of it? I have no idea. One person said it seems to think as an adult that their symptoms of, of um, you know, their neurological issues are improving. If they're still young and still developing, you know, they'll probably get more out of it. Um, as, as far as, you know, recovery is concerned, or at least the other parts of the brain compensating for, for um, the damage there. But either way, it's going to help them a lot. It's going to make them feel a lot better. It's going to make them uh, a lot healthier in a lot of ways. And uh, I think it's definitely, definitely worth a go. I, you know, it's probably, there's, there is such a thing as damage done. And, you know, super palsy, you have this sort of damaged area that's not going to come back completely. I would, I would not think that that would happen, but can something come back and a little bit happen? Uh, yeah, potentially. And it's worth a shot anyway. All right. John Albert, uh, $1.99, any tips for finding a carnivore friendly doctor? Ooh, yeah, difficult. There, there are usually lists of, uh, keto doctors and most keto doctors are at least in the realm of, of carnivore, right? So you you what, what do you, you stop eating carbs? What do you, what do you eat? Right. You have to eat protein and fat. You know, most of that's going to be derived from, from animal sources, right? Um, now they may have different funny ideas about, you know, why you really need spinach in your diet, but you know, you can, you can sort of, you know, take, take the good, uh, with the bad and, um, you know, and just sort of, uh, you know, do your own thing. But, um, that's what I would do is I would, I would do a, a web search for, you know, keto doctors, ketogenic doctors or whatever that in your area functional medicine doctors, usually more savvy with this sort of thing, but not always, you know, so I would, I would look for ketogenic doctors in your area, low carb down under in Australia. If you're in Australia, they have a, a website with different low carb carnivore doctors, the you know, keto doctors, they, that's what they call low carb doctors. Um, many of them are very, are either carnivore themselves or, or at least carnivore adjacent and carnivore friendly. And so you can look up there. There's a low carb USA and there's other like Rivero health and different sorts of uh, things in the U S you can also find, um, you know, different lists of, of doctors in different areas. And so, yeah. So depending on where you are, just sort of Google around and look for, for keto doctors in your area. There's usually a list that someone's put together. All right. Trey Coleman, uh, super chat. Thanks. This next one is a multi-part. Let's see here. Victim of a serious crime. Mm -hmm. Late middle-aged guy had a beautiful home and oh, business no. stolen from me. Police can't help Jeez. trying to stay off the street for 15 years. Oh, As no. a result, carbs call me down. Carnivore, lion, ribeye give me clarity. Uncontrollable rage. Probably useful in Paleolithic yeah. era, but now I had to stop. After yeah. a month to avoid being arrested, it was really bad, uncontrollable against all yeah. who hurt me, including police. Tried the diet twice, took electrolytes. I think there's one more here. Uh, full blood test, all normal, normal. Never have been violent in my life before. I wonder if successful carnivores haven't been crime victims with long-term effects. Whew, that's a big one. Um, well, no, normally, normally actually people get more chilled out. On a carnivore diet, you know, the thing is carnivore Zen. That's actually one of the Facebook groups, um, and uh, and um, you know I'm, I'm you know much more sort of level as well. Um, but yeah, it can make it can make your your you know, your brain work better, and you can think about these things. You can get very pissed about these things. You know, it's it's you know it's very understandable that you're furious in that situation, and when your brain's working, you're not being suppressed and and uh you know sort of i guess mollified but but uh really you, you know, it's sort of depressing you down you know i mean this, this is why they used to give out you know bread and circuses in roman times because it was specifically bread they cut off the meat supply and they gave out bread so no one could get meat they only ate bread it just make you docile so you know having those sorts of things making you docile you know that could be what's going on you know, when you're, 
when you're healthy and your body's working, your brain's working, you can think about things, those, and you have some things to think about that are going to upset you. They're going to, they're going to upset you. Um, it can also increase your testosterone <laughs> and, um, you know, and that could, that can fire you up as well. Most people get, get more chill. You have a good reason for being upset. And so I, I don't think that's a consequence of carnivore. I think carnivore is just making you healthy and, and making you, um, you know, and, and making your body work better. And you have a lot of real issues and real understandable reasons to be extremely angry. Put that into a direction that might be helpful. I don't, I don't know the situation. I don't know if it's possible to pursue legal means at this point or do anything from, you know, from a from a legal standpoint or, or you know, uh, do do something else that's not going to get you in trouble. But you know, if you if you try to direct that, you know, doing carnivore, getting healthy, getting your brain workout, being like, I'm really pissed, and then focusing that and directing that in something, even just focusing that and directing it in a new business, do this, be like, you know, screw them, you know, the best revenge is a good life. As you go back and you 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 build back even bigger and stronger and better and be like, look what you lost out on, dickhead. You know, you could have been, we could have been partners with this. We could have been, you know, you could have been a part of this, but no, you're not, you're, you're screwed. And now you buy them out and stomp them out and, you know, destroy them in, in some sort of business venture. I don't know. It's uh maybe, maybe a pipe dream, maybe, you know, sort of just wishful thinking, but people have done it. You know, people have done th things like that. And, but either way, you know, doing something productive for you to get your life back. And to you know live a good life is, is is always going to be better. Again, you know, even if you never encounter these people again, you know, if you are doing well and you're back being successful, you know, that's gonna piss them off more than than uh, anything else will. All right, from Martin. Uh, thanks for what you're doing. Would appreciate answering my previous question about folic acid and vitamin C insufficiency. I just looked back. I couldn't find that question, but I think it's just generally about folic acid and vitamin C insufficiency. Um, okay. Um, so look, some, some people um, aren't able to to get enough folic acid just from from muscle meat, you know, in in grain finished beef, right? Regeneratively raised beef, probably just fine, especially eggs. Uh, regeneratively raised eggs. There's one guy uh, talking about his eggs had like 25 times the amount of folate as normal eggs that you get out eggs you know egg yolks things like that have more folate liver has more folate so if you need a bit more folate folic acid then you know just eat more egg yolks hopefully you know get them regeneratively raised pasture raised sort of things they're eating just bugs and lizards and things like that um they're going to be healthier they're going to have better better folate and um, and, and you're just having a bit of liver. So sometimes we will do that. So vitamin C insufficiency, I mean, you, you don't need as much vitamin C, you know, on a carnivore diet. You just simply don't, you know, because you're, you're making, uh, collagen from, you know, pre-built building blocks. Right. And so, you know, you need vitamin C to stave off scurvy because it hydrolyzes proline and lysine, which makes tightly bound, um, collagen. Right. You're getting those things already hydrolyzed when you're eating meat that has collagen that has these uh, hydrolyzed amino acids, and so you, you don't need as much vitamin C. So I, I don't know if you had vitamin C tested on a lab, but if you don't have any symptoms, you don't have any problems. You know, it's not really an issue. There's there's more vitamin C in liver as well, especially sort of less cooked liver that's going to sort of preserve a bit more of that. Um, so if you're worried about that. You know, just have a, have a bit more liver that'll cover your folate and your vitamin C, but you really don't need vitamin C uh, for scurvy anyway on, on this. There, there are other things that we use vitamin C for. Um, it's not the antioxidant that you need. That's the, that's um, urea. You know, we actually stopped making vitamin C a long time ago. You don't stop doing something. You don't, you don't actually lose a trait, a genetic trait. Unless there's the unless there's a survival advantage to lose it, so us and you know I think guinea pigs have lost the ability to make vitamin C. So there's obviously something to that. So you know it's thought theorized that when we started eating a lot more meat, became more carnivorous, we started eating we started getting much more urea that took care of the um, the demands that we needed for um, you know oxidative stress and things like that. And then you know now we're having 
too much uh, vitamin C and uh, more than we needed. And that actually can metabolize into oxalates. And so maybe we're getting oxalate problems. So the people who are making less and less vitamin C didn't get all the kidney damage and oxalate poisoning and things like that. Uh, so potentially that's one of them. But whatever reason, we stopped making vitamin C because we got everything we needed from meat. Um, so if you think you need a bit more, have a bit of liver, that'll take care of the folate as well. All right. Uh, question. Does carnivore cure gum, gum disease? It can. Yeah. So it depends on the cause of all these things. But yeah, I know a number of people have, have cured that. There's uh, Dr. Kevin Stock, who's a dentist, and he, he talks about this a lot. He does carnivore and he, he promotes a carnivore diet for uh, people on the internet and his patients as well. Uh, Jordan Peterson cured his gum disease on a carnivore diet. I so, uh, the secretary at my um uh, medical practice actually just cured her gum disease and uh, she always had this as something that you're not supposed to be able to cure and her dentist was just like how the hell do you do this you've had this for <laughs> years and years and years you know this is this doesn't just go away like how what the hell happened uh so yeah it absolutely can yeah it depends on what's causing it but uh, for a lot of people they've been they've been fixing their gut gum disease and um and uh significantly improving their their oral health Will carnivore diet help in extreme case of Lyme's inflammation, even in the voice box? Any studies or data to research this? Mm. Thank you. God bless you. Are a godsend. Um, no, I don't know of any any studies. There's, there's a lot of well, there are there are you know there is research and and um, publications like going back into the 1800s with with um, uh, Dr. Uh, J. H. Salisbury made the Salisbury steak and, you know, really pushed a, a red meat and water diet for a lot of these people. And then subsequently people came after that. And, and some of that was with Lyme uh, disease, but um, I, well, certainly don't know of any specifically with the voice box, but I've, I've seen a number of people, a lot of people do come to carnivore with, you know, having issues with Lyme disease. It's one of those nasty ones that take a long time. And it's like autoimmune issues that can, uh, that can really be stubborn if you're not very, very, on top of it and very strict. And so what Salisbury found is that you really need just red meat and water, red meat and water. And, and that beef was much better than lamb. So that's sort of what they found. So, uh, and I've certainly found that certainly red meat is much, much, much better for, for these cases. Um, so that's what I would do. And I would just eat like literally only eat red meat and water, not even using spices or seasoning sauces or not drinking coffee, anything like that. I just eat, you know, beef. I would only eat water. I don't even really salt anymore. So just, just meat and water. And uh, that's what I would do for that. It's going to take time. It's going to take months. It's going to take many months potentially, you know, hopefully it gets better, but uh, yeah, it's just, it's just people's, um, you know, description of their, of their improvement, but a lot of people are improving. So hopefully yours does too. All right. Christy says, I've been on carnivore for eight weeks now and starting to experience severe stomach problems. Drink a gallon of water mm. a day with lemon juice twice daily help. Well, it depends on what's, what's causing your stomach problems. So, um, you know, I, I wouldn't really expect lemon juice to, to help necessarily, um, you know, you're, you're going to get things that you don't necessarily want. Like all citrus has phreatocoumarins, which are make you light sensitive. And so UV light reacts with that and can make you uh, have problems otherwise. And you can also, your, your liver has to detox these things and, and so on. They, those can cause problems, but you know, a bit of lemon juice, probably not the end of the world, but it's, um, uh, I would, I don't know why it would help your, your stomach problems. I don't, I don't know what your stomach problems are, unfortunately. Um, so that, that really does, does sort of matter what I would do is I would, you know, do like a food diary, food and symptom diary, where you just write down exactly what you're eating, exactly when you're eating, how much you're eating it. And then when these sort of symptoms come on, if you're getting this just directly after you know, your stomach, you know, you could have other sorts of things. And that might be something you need to speak to your doctor about, you know, maybe you had like, developed an ulcer or something like that. And you had had pain, you, you're not going to develop an ulcer from a carnivore diet, it would be something else. Uh, added on to that, but there are other things that can cause ulcers. And so, you know, it, it really just depends on what, what are causing your, your diet, your stomach problems. So severe stomach problems, that sounds like probably severe stomach pain. Um, if a bit of lemon juice helps, great, you know, uh, but I would, I would try the diary, check your symptoms, check when they're happening and in relation to food and things like that. So mark down when you're eating, mark down when you're having the symptoms and, and be as, as, as 
precise and give as much details as possible. And um, you can try having a bit of lemon juice. I don't, you know, I don't know what's causing your, I don't, I don't know what your stomach issues are. I don't know what's causing them. So I don't know if that would help. I doubt it will. I don't think it's going to help anything um, in particular, but you at least have some information. You can see, okay, maybe this isn't actually even associated with the food I'm eating, or maybe it's only associated with the certain things that I'm eating. And you can just sort of eliminate those things, or it gives you just a piece of information and, and some documented objective uh, symptoms that you can then go take to your doctor and say, Hey, something weird is happening. Seems to be a bit, a bit of a weird pattern here. You know, can we, can we check this out? And they might order, you know, some investigations like a scope and see if you have gastritis or, or something else that uh, might need uh, some help with. So that's, that's what I would do. All right. Caller said mainly carnivore, but I do eat grapes and honey for my sweet tooth once per day. Is this actually <laughs> natural if my main goal is weight loss and muscle gain? Um, yeah, look, I mean, it's a lot better than, than a lot of other things, but you know, uh, the honey and the grapes, these are sugar, you know, that's going to raise your blood sugar. It's going to raise your insulin. That's going to stall weight loss or it's certainly not going to help your weight loss. It depends on how much you're eating, of course, but you know, anything addictive, a little bit of something addictive easily and quickly turns into a lot of something addictive. And so that's just something that you don't want to, I, I just, I just don't think it's, it's uh, worth playing with honestly and I, I don't think it's doing anything for you um and yeah and, and that's why you we're doing this thing you know because it's a sweet tooth right and so it's an addiction but like any addiction you know it can it can go away and like any addiction you should probably get rid of it right it's not it's not really helping you being addicted to something like that and 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 sort of eating things compulsively because you just you really really want to right so you know you should try uh to to get rid of that if you can and at least reduce that um as well but you know after about two weeks generally these cravings go away you know and you don't really miss it if you are having cravings just eat a lot more meat you know if you start going like oh i really want that honey i really want that eat a steak eat some meat fill yourself up with fatty meat people tend to have very little um you know, cravings and sugar cravings and things like that after that. So, um, yeah, just give that a shot and uh, hopefully you can come off it because yeah, I, I do think that you would be better off without fruit and honey. Yeah. All right, Steve, uh, 61 year old male, strict carnivore, no dairy for eight weeks, down 30 pounds, 5'11", 148 pounds. Now I have yet to have a solid stool. When will that change? <laughs> uh, <laughs> Um, yeah, look, so, so, <laughs> so I did, I did a video called, you know, you don't need fiber and in parentheses of fiber, constipation and diet. I'm still playing around with these names to see what, what helps the algorithm more or less, but, um, that's, that's what it's called right now. It might be called something else later, but, you know, it goes into sort of the main reasons or the most common reasons why you, you might experience either constipation or diarrhea. Um, most commonly it's that people are still drinking coffee and when you get rid of fiber, you know, you're, 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 this laxative is now going to be much more powerful because you don't have a whole, this big blockages to just sort of move through like, you know, a bunch of semi trucks and traffic right now. It's just this open highways. Things are going to just be flooding through there. So, uh, if you're drinking coffee, you're drinking tea, or you're using artificial sweeteners, usually in the coffee or tea, get rid of them. They're all laxatives. You don't need them. You don't want them. And they, they will give you loose stools. Um, if you're not doing any of that, if you're exclusively eating meat and you're exclusively drinking water, it's, it's most often because you're eating a lot more fat than your body can absorb. So there's that overflow valve. Our body can only absorb a certain amount of fat at a time. We run out of bile. We can only absorb very little after that. And so the rest of that goes out. And so if you're eating a lot more fat than your body can absorb, well, then that, that means it's going to come out, you know, in, uh, in, in liquid fashion. So if that's the case, you can sort of just pull back a bit and see how you do. The other side is you could be so constipated because you're not eating nearly enough fat. And that's usually what happens when people aren't eating enough fat. Um, they can get quite constipated and sort of blocked up and actually liquid stools sort of squirt around that. So you actually get liquid uh, stools. And then every now and then you get a big, hard, chunky, very difficult to pass stool. And that's called overflow diarrhea or spurious diarrhea. And that's, um, that means you need to eat a lot more fat and, uh, and sort of clear that stuff out. And, um, yeah. And then there's a, a few people that 
have done all those sorts of things and they still are just having loose stools and and for them they just need to get it for some reason people have problems with like rendered fat like you know like butter and tallow and things like that it just goes through their body too quick their body doesn't have a chance to absorb it so they need to eat more of the whole fat like the the tissue fat so the fat in the cellular structure of, of the fat on the the meat itself as opposed to like rendered out liquid fat that's come out from cooking um they do better with that and then about three people now even that wasn't enough and then they started cutting off the fat when the when it was raw before they cooked it and they they would eat the fat uncooked and then they would cook up uh, the rest of the meat and that did it so you know there's a lot of different options in there 95 percent of the time it's either coffee tea artificial sweeteners or you're eating too much fat all right uh holistic love hey dr chafee is if you suffer from candida is carnivore a good way to go thank you oh uh, yeah it can be you know because the thing is, is is you're going to optimize your your body's biome as well so your oral biome your microbiome in your in your gut and in, in various sorts of you know flora around your around your body can it can certainly improve that um sometimes you need a bit of help sometimes you need a like an antifungal or something like that depending on where it is and how bad it is so you know i i you know i'm still you know a doctor i still think that that, that medicines are useful in certain select circumstances um you know if your body is, is having trouble clearing something or needs a bit of help so you know yes going carnivore can help your immune system it can help clear infections it can help optimize your your body's flora um you know in your in your mouth and your digestion tract and you know, and elsewhere and so uh that can definitely help that but if you still need medicine on top of that there is medicine available all right thank you zeta and then we have the carnivore boss question best response <laughs> to friends who either have fibromyalgia or have children on the autism spectrum when they insist that these are neurological disorders unaffected by dietary changes. Oh, well, you know, you can just, you just point them in the way of, of um, uh, Dr. Chris Palmer, Professor Chris Palmer from Harvard, um, who has actually shown, uh, nope, that's not the case. So yes, these are neurological disorders that have a strong dietary component, at least for, for autism. And he's, he's reversing uh, people with schizophrenia. He's curing people with schizophrenia through diet, right? And so, you know, that's not supposed to happen. He has a better success rate than the standard of care, medicine and, and uh, counseling and things like that, right? So what's happening here? Well, you know, he writes a whole book about why uh, that is. It has to do with mitochondria. Mitochondria aren't working properly. In autism, you have mitochondria that aren't working properly. You don't get neural neurons developing properly and you get autism. Uh, that's actually been shown by Texas A&M to be absolutely uh, diet related. There's a number of studies that show a strong relationship between uh, diet and uh, autism. Um, there's a study showing that, you know, women who ate more red meat uh, preconception had and, and red meat products had uh, lower rates of kids with autism, that women who ate more saturated fat during pregnancy and had higher LDL cholesterol, that dreaded LDL cholesterol, um, had lower rates of kids with autism, that women who breastfed their kids, lower rates of autism versus uh, bottle fed, right? You know, bottle fed formula, they didn't differentiate between people who, um, you know, ex you know, ex uh, expressed and um, collected their breast milk or used formula, but the vast majority of people who use bottles use uh, formula and juices and all that sort of garbage. And so strong relationship between nutrition and autism, certainly. Texas A&M actually showed causation between uh, or, or causative relationship between um, diet and autism in that they showed that vegans and vegetarians have a much higher rates of kids with autism. Okay. Okay. So why the hell is that? Well, they found that they say, well, carnitine is a, is supposedly a non-essential amino acid that, you know, we make this, we don't need it from our diet. Well, first of all, we actually benefit from having more of it. First of all, second of all, only 70% of people make it. 30% of people don't make it at all or don't make enough of it, right? So they need it from their diet. It is essential to them. And so if you're one of these kids that that needs more carnitine from your diet and your, and your parents are really depriving you and starving you of essential nutrients, 
uh, you're not going to get these essential nutrients. You're not going to be able to develop your brain probably because carnitine is integral for mitochondrial health and for neuronal development. And so if you don't have enough carnitine or you don't have any carnitine, your brain will not function properly. It will not develop properly. It will not function properly. And uh, and the fact of the matter is, that, I mean, there's there's studies actually called you know ketogenic diet as a treatment modality for autism. So that's in the published literature. You know, people are already treating uh, people with autism with uh, a ketogenic diet. Carnivore diet is a ketogenic diet. So yes, well, of course, this is related to uh, dietary changes. Fibromyalgia, what the hell is fibromyalgia? Ask them to explain what that is. Is it a neurological disorder? Mm, is it? No one knows what fibromyalgia is. It, it's, a, it's a diagnosis of exclusion. You know, you have all these other sorts of things and you just say, okay, we have no idea what it is. Fibromyalgia. Most people, most doctors think that this is people making it up. Most people think it, it's, it's drug seeking behavior or it's just in their head, right? And uh, I don't because I've seen people recover very well. They've gone on a carnivore diet and I've had people tell me, I have, I have a, a, um, an episode on YouTube called chronic pain, fibromyalgia, all that sort of stuff, right? You look it up with fibromyalgia and pain and all that sort of stuff. You'll see it and look at the comments and you'll see hundreds and hundreds of comments from different people who had had fibromyalgia or radiculopathy and nerve pain, and sciatica and all these sorts of things. They went on a carnivore diet, and uh, many of these people are saying they've had been long-term sufferers. One guy said that he had he, that one month on carnivore, it was the first time in 12 years that he didn't take opiates for his fibromyalgia and sciatica, right? And he's like, thank God I can come off these things because he hated it for all that time. You know, talking about restricting and limiting yourself, you know, like that's you know, that's restricting and limiting, being so caught up with pain and being doped up and drugged up that you can't function properly for 12 years of his life. You know, that's horrible. Uh, it's all of it. Every Your life is, is related to diet. Everything's related to diet. Getting your arm chopped off, probably not related to diet. Everything else, diet. Fibromyalgia, that sounds like IBS. That's what I think of when I hear IBS because I was diagnosed with that. It's like, well, we don't know what's wrong with you. You've got IBS. It's just now it's just eating the standard American diet. Yeah, it's eating crap. Yeah. Please help me understand the relation between the pH in the stomach, the pH in the blood, and the relation to being able to become full carnivore. Um, well, I mean, pH in your stomach and pH in your, in your blood are just com two completely se separate systems. So the pH in, in your blood needs to sort of be at a very specific level between 7.35 and 7.45. It goes outside of that very narrow range and you get very, very sick. And so, you know, that's the, the optimal pH for your body to run properly. So there's a lot of reasons why that is, but the pH in your stomach is, is a little different because you need it to be. Uh, very acidic to kill off the bacteria because normally we, we would be eating things that have a high bacteria load because refrigerators are very recent and uh, you know commercialized you know uh, beef is very recent as well and so you know normally we were hunting and we had to sort of eat things over several days and they'd have a high bacterial load or maybe we're scavenging and do all that sort of stuff so our, our stomach pH had to be very very low very acidic it's it's you know it's in that range of carnivores and even like scavenger carnivores that are just eating like carrion and things like that, like you know, vultures and, and uh, other, other sorts of scavengers as well. So that just needs to be very low way to optimize that. Eat what you're supposed to eat. Don't take medications that would disrupt that. And, um, and don't drink a lot of water uh, before you eat. Then you'll keep your, your stomach acid nice and concentrated the way it's supposed to be. And you'll just, you know, You'll, you'll do very well in your digestion as well. Um, and so, you know, being carnivore, just then, you know, just don't, don't, don't drink water for like an hour before you're going to eat and try not to drink water as you're eating. So an hour before, hour after you're going to, you know, keep your, your stomach acid, you know, pretty concentrated. You know, some people say actually two hours, like Salisbury would say two hours before or after you don't want to eat. You don't want to drink water. You keep it very, very concentrated, and that that helps with digestion. So uh, that's it. But yeah, you're you're you know if you're if you're taking a whole bunch of medications that's going to uh, mess with your stomach pH, like a whole bunch of you know like antacids and things like that, your body can sort of keep pushing out 
you know, acids, okay, hey, no, we need more of this, we need more of this, we need more of this, that can actually give you like a metabolic alkalosis. So your your blood pH goes too high, you can do different things that, that screw with your body. Uh, don't, you know, just just eat what you're supposed to eat. And, uh, and let your body get on with it. Don't take a bunch of medications and try to you know, you don't try to micromanage your, your your millions of years of evolution or God's design or whatever you want want to want to think about. Either way, we're designed to do a certain thing. You're not going to figure that out better than your body already has. So just just let your body do its thing. You'll be fine. Tony J, thank you. Two dollars. Uh, Zeta, two months on carnivore diet, beef, butter, bacon, eggs, but I'm gaining weight. Clothes have gotten tighter. I also have more cellulite. Hmm. Okay. Well, um, okay. So if you're eating anything else, so sometimes people will still be eating uh, artificial sweeteners. That's a major one that people gain on. And they say, no, no, I'm just eating carnivore, this, that, and the other. Okay. What exactly are you eating? Anything else? And it'll come out that they're having like monk fruit sugar or stevia, or they're having, you know, uh, different sorts of you know, electrolytes or whatever with stevia in it or other sorts of things or dairy. Dairy is a major one that people can stall on or, or gain well, weight on. Um, it's very rare uh, that someone is just eating meat and only drinking water and actually putting on fat. It does happen. Uh, Kelly Hogan uh, was one of those people. She, she put on weight. Um, you can also put on weight that's healthy like um, – like, uh, you know, you can put on muscle and bone density and then not really lose much fat and you can, you know, put on weight on the scale. Um, some people have difficulty losing fat early on or even, you know, middle distance um, just due to, to hormonal disruption like rampant leptin resistance. So you're, you're having chronically high insulin that's blocking your leptin. You're drink, you're eating a bunch of lectins that can block leptin as well. And you become leptin resistant because your leptin is massively elevated and, and your body's just screaming out, stop eating, stop eating, stop eating. And you can't actually see it because you're leptin resistant. So that can be an issue. I've seen some people with massively elevated leptins, like well over 100, that um, some of them will lose some weight, but most of them, it's, it's more slow. Some of them don't really lose any weight, but they gain health. They feel better. They're coming off medications. They're putting their their um, uh, autoimmune issues into remission, and that's what's important. So you need to focus on health. You need to get rid of anything that's not meat and water, anything, Right. Um, and then focus on your health, focus on how you're feeling and then give your body time, right? If you're doing beef, butter, bacon, and eggs, you know, maybe just cut that down to beef. You know, most people will do great on beef, butter, bacon, and eggs. Some people need to be just on beef and water, nothing else, nothing else at all, not even seasonings or spices, certainly no sweeteners and, uh, and no dairy. Just, just try that. And, and if you're, you know, one of the people that are just in that situation, like Kelly Hogan was, first of all, watch Kelly Hogan, see that I have an interview with her. We should, we talk about that. And, you know, that, that can be quite helpful because like, okay, I'm not the only one that's experienced this. It is rare. And I'm, I hope it's not the case that, you know, that's not the case, but if it is, it's okay. There, you know, it happens. It just takes time. It just takes time for your body to heal. You're gonna have a lot of hormonal issues. You're gonna have leptin, which is very important for a lot of other other hormones. Getting your insulin down, getting your insulin uh, resistance and sensitivity back to normal, and uh, and a lot of other things. You have a lot of other hormones that are gonna be in play: thyroid, estrogen, so on. These will take time to normalize. When they get into better levels, you'll start seeing more fat loss. Uh, which is not the same as weight loss because you can put on muscle and you can lose fat and you stay the same weight. And so focus on your health, give it time, just beef and water, see how you go. In time, it should get better. Those people with those high leptins, that leptin does come down and eventually that will come down to a more normal level. And that's when you start seeing the fat loss really take off. It will happen. Just be patient and just really focus on your health, health and how you feel because that's the main thing. Yeah. I did that same thing 46 days ago, switched to just beef and water from BBBE. I feel so much better. The weight started coming off. I was just steady for a while, but I'm I'm on lion diet, just beef, 
salt and water for life now. I feel way better. It's a lot easier nice. too. And yeah, the weight just keeps coming off. Trey Coleman, five dollars. Twenty-one year old male here, been carnivore for about a month. I was diagnosed with hypothyroidism when I was nine years old. Anyway, carnivore can reverse hypothyroidism. Uh, well, it depends on on the cause of hypothyroidism, but yeah, I see I see people improve their thyroid issues all the time, and you know, there's people like Hashimoto's can be a cause of hypothyroidism, and that uh, that can improve. That takes longer. Um, any autoimmune issue, you have to be very strict. Just just beef and water, really, uh, nothing else. Very, you have to be very very on it, and uh, and you'll you'll improve mostly from that anyway. You'll get most improvement from that as well. And uh, yeah, I can get better. You know, if you have something that's damaged your thyroid and it's permanently damaged, you know, it may not come back. You know, there is such thing as damage done. It, may, it could be permanent. But yes, there are a lot of people improve their, their thyroid dramatically. Just give your body as much as it needs and uh, and see what happens. And, you know, you, you will improve in many, many, many other ways anyway. And uh, yeah, you could absolutely improve your thyroid. All right. Carnivore in Christ. Could carnivore diet shrink uterine fibroids? Uterine. Uh, yeah, uterine fibroids. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. So a lot of uterine fibroids are actually caused by uh, insulin resistance. So having a kind of chronically high uh, blood sugar, blood glucose, and high insulin can actually trigger the growth of uterine fibroids. And so that's something that ketogenic diets have already been shown to do. You can actually uh, you know, shrink those down. Yeah. So in a, in a carnivore diet is a type of ketogenic diet. Uh, or it should be right. So if you're doing fruit and honey, all that sort of stuff, that's not ketogenic. You need you need to be ketogenic, especially for this one. So doing a carnivore diet, no carbs and sugar. What I consider a carnivore diet is just meat and water, right? So people say, oh, I do carnivore and I have, you know, lamb. You know, I have lamb and honey and and fruit and sugar and you know daffodils and whatever the hell they eat. Like I just okay. That's not exactly what we're talking here. So, you know, if you're talking, if you're saying carnivore, you should, you should just mean just meat, just water. You could say, I do meat based and I do the X, Y, and Z. That's not meat. It just, it's, it makes it much more clear for everybody, but like, you know, carnivore just means meat, just means water, you know, and that, that makes it easier. So if you're just eating meat, only drinking water, uh, yes, that should help. All right. We're almost to the bottom. This is turning into like a telethon. This is awesome. We, they keep adding more on here. You're still good for a couple more? Sure. Okay. The complaining channel, $5. A quick follow-up. Thanks. Legal, not possible. Maybe I'll try lion diet and write a book. What happened to me to try to keep distracted? And then one more from there. Here. You go. Uh, oh, this is going to be tough. Can it reduce and cure angiokeratoma of Fortici? Uh, I, I don't know. I, I don't actually know what that is. So, um, you know, there's a lot of things that we're just sort of just seeing and, and just saying, hey, I've, I've seen that. I've seen enough Crohn's, you know, patients uh, get, go put into mission, remission that I can confidently say now this this will help people with Crohn's. And there's, there's um, you know, sort of adjacent studies like the one with elemental diet and, you know, just removing carbs and fiber that put people in remission and without without medications, right? So um, those I can speak more confidently on. Other other things we're just sort of seeing, you know, anecdotally. And uh, that one I haven't even heard of before. So unfortunately, I don't know. But um, but again, like like anything else, it, it's going to allow your body to work properly. And so many things are related to eating the wrong thing. And so it's just more and more and more things I'm just seeing people are coming up and like, wow, it's helping this. It's helping vitiligo. You know, I didn't you know, that, that was a surprise to me. People had, you know, uh, you know, bleach skin, you know, the Michael Jackson, supposedly Michael Jackson disease where it sort of it was just going to, you know, losing all the melanin and things like that. Not only did it stop progressing, the melanin came back and they had they, the pigmentation came back. So I was like that. Well, that's amazing. So you just you're just seeing these things. And, um, you know, and, it, and it's it's impressive. And you try to sort of relay that to other people that may be experiencing the same thing. And then it's just worth a shot. You know, there's no guarantees on, on things like that, that we don't have like good studies for or anything like that, or even know what the hell they are, but you know, it's always worth a shot and just to see, uh, what happens. And, and again, you're going to improve on a lot, you know, in a lot of other ways. Um, and that, so, you know, even if it doesn't, doesn't help that it's going to make your life a lot better in, in any case. Yeah. Joe Rogan's back on carnivore and he has uh, Vitalago and it's helped him tremendously. Oh. Uh, Nice. 
Edison Twain, how many liters of oral electrolytes do you need to consume per day? I take this one called electrolyte that they sell here in Mexico. Oh, if, if you're just doing carnivores, just doing, doing meat and water, I don't think you need to take that. You know, some people do, especially early on when their insulin is normalized. And once your insulin gets to a normal, stable, low level, you know, and your body's sort of adjusted to that, you, you usually don't need to do that. You know, if you're sort of feeling symptomatic and weird and whatever, and you feel that those electrolytes are helpful, you know, go for it. But uh, most people don't need them. I mean, most people don't even need salt. Like I don't need, I don't even salt anymore. I'm, I'm perfectly fine. I, you know, you know, I still sweat, you know, I still work out. I still have, have tons of energy. I don't get cramps, you know, all these sorts of things. So, um, I don't think you need to do that. Um, but you know, if you're going to take any electrolyte, then you need to make sure that it's not anything that has any sweeteners or flavorings. That's really important. That stuff is really not good for you. So tastes like crap, whatever, you know, if you, if you want to take it, then, then, you know, uh, take the unsweetened, unflavored version, you know, that stevia, oh, it's natural. Okay. Arsenic's natural. Sugar's natural. Stevia comes from a plant. It's natural. It's natural from a plant. Yes, sugar is natural from a plant. That's what we're specifically trying to avoid here by using stevia. So that's not the, not, um, uh, you know, justification. So, uh, yeah, just, just use, if you're going to use electrolytes, I don't think most people need to use them. Some people may, um, but if you're going to use them, just get them without sweeteners or flavorings. I thought doing lion, I was at the most extreme I could be. Now I have to start considering the salt thing some more because I'm still doing salt. <laughs> Joshua, $24. Thank you so much. Michelle, Dr. Chafee, what do you think about sugar-free, no cal carb G fuel it has caffeine? Thank you. Um, yeah. So, I mean, that, that's going to be, I don't know what G fuel is, but it sounds you know like something you get in a can. If it is, it's going to have, you look at the ingredients list, it's going to have you know, 30 different things that you don't recognize uh, and artificial sweeteners. Artificial sweeteners are awful. They are awful. You don't want to do that. There's a study. I mean, there's a lot of things that are coming out like aspartame. WHO has just classified as a carcinogen. They've also classified processed meat as a carcinogen. So God, the hell, you know, who the hell knows? But this is something I've heard since I was a kid in the 80s that aspartame was likely carcinogenic. And there were sort of studies that suggested that. But, you know, there's a lot of you know, industry money going into research. And, oh, no, 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 it definitely didn't. Well, there were decades of, of industry funded research saying that cigarettes didn't cause cancer either. And they, they damn well knew that it did. And that came out. Um, so any, anything like that, I wouldn't do. So I think it's as important what not to eat or drink as it is what to eat. You need to eat meat, fatty meat, because that's what gives you, you know, your life, right? but all the other things can cause harm. So they're just as important to not eat those things, right? So my hard rule is no plants or fungus, no sugar or any sweeteners, nothing artificial. So that is probably all three, you know? And so I, I, would, I, would, I would avoid it for sure. If you want some caffeine, even though it's a neurotoxin, even though it was developed as an insecticide to fry the brains of insects trying to eat that plant, um, I would just take it as a pill, right? Because you want the caffeine to wake you up. Do you want all the thousands of other chemicals that are in uh, you know, tea and coffee or the God knows what the hell else is in that G Fuel stuff? Uh, no, you don't. So you just want the coffee, the caffeine. You know, you can take some caffeine. It's eight bucks for a bottle on uh, Amazon. It'll last you a year and it costs, you know, what a Starbucks or one of those, um, you know, you know, goat fuels will cost you. So, you know, I don't, um, I don't, I wouldn't eat, I wouldn't drink that crap. And, you know, any sort of um, artificial sweetener, you really want to get rid of those things are, they're highly addictive and they're very, very bad for you. I would, I would stay far away from those. All right, Tony asked, uh, hi, why did Dr. Chafee stop carnivore when younger? Oh, you know, just because I, I didn't know, I wasn't, I wasn't doing carnivore per se. I was just, I was just avoiding plants. And so I learned how toxic plants were. I was learning how, you know, in, in, in botany, biology and, and cancer biology, just how toxic plants were. And I had a cancer prof a professor of cancer biology at, at University of Washington in Seattle, who I wish I could track down. Um, but I, I don't, I don't remember his name, <laughs> uh, you know, 23 years ago at this point. And I tried actually looking through the, you know, the, um, the records that 
at UW online, but I couldn't, I couldn't find it, unfortunately. But, you know, he just showed us how toxic these things were, how many, you know, dozens or over a over hundred, you know, carcinogens that were in uh, just, just, you know, vegetables that you'd eat on a daily basis. And he, uh, you know, we were all just blown away and shocked. And he just, you know, we were just like, oh, but how, how can that be? And he just looked at us and just said, look, you know, I don't eat salad. I don't eat vegetables. I don't let my kids eat vegetables. Plants are trying to kill you, right? So he's like, get it through your heads. This is how plants defend themselves. It's kill or be killed in the wild for plants as well as animals. And so they will defend themselves with lethal force if necessary, right? And so they do. And so at that point, I just said, right, screw it. I'm not eating any plants. And I just defaulted into eating eggs and meat because there really wasn't anything left. I went to the store. I'm like, what the hell do I eat? Because everything has plants in it. And you go go to the store now and you look around. You you know, you know, you look at it as a percentage, like what the hell here does not have plants in it? It's just the meat and, and dairy aisle. That's it. You know, and so, you know, dairy, I have a bunch of you know soy crap and things like that in there now infiltrated it like a cancer. But, you know, that was it. And so I just I just started eating. I just started eating uh, just meat and eggs. And, and that was it. And I never felt better, never performed better athletically until, you know, now. But I don't have the time to train eight hours a day now. And, um, you know, and I just felt absolutely amazing. But then I was in England and I was playing rugby over there and I just. Uh, they just didn't have the same access to meat. Some of it was breaded. And I was just like, okay, well, maybe it's not that big of a deal. Dose makes the poison. You know, maybe maybe just having some some crumbing on the chicken is not that big. And it wasn't even that all that often. It wasn't like every day. You know, it was like every every couple of days or something like that. Uh, it was enough. You know, it was it was enough to to knock me off my game. And I remember thinking, I was like, why am I not as feeling as just superhuman amazing as I normally do? Like what's going on? And I pushing myself. I'm not working as hard. Like, um, am I just 25 now? Am I just old, which is over the hill and just dying now? And you know, I just didn't know what it was. I figured I was just getting old. And, um, but that's when I started slipping off of that without realizing it because, you know, I made that concession of like, oh, well, maybe it's not that big of a deal. And then a little bit, something else wasn't that big of a deal and a little bit more, a little bit more. And all of a sudden I, I started seeing things materialize. I never, I, I just didn't look at bread or ketchup or anything like that as food ever. You know, because it wasn't food to me, you know, so I, I just didn't see it. I just didn't register. Now, all of a sudden, you know, you open the fridge up and there's like 90 bottles of ketchup because these are English rugby players. And they just they put ketchup on everything. And so they just call it sauce. Pass the sauce. There's only one sauce. It's, 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 what kind of sauce? No, it's just it's just the one. It's just it's just ketchup. Right. And so, you know, there's just all of a sudden I was just like, Jesus Christ, it's a lot of ketchup. I'm like, oh, I haven't used ketchup in a while. Well, I guess I guess I'll use that. Now. Just completely blanking on the fact that like i of course, I haven't eaten this stuff in five years because I was specifically not eating anything with plants in it. And then that sort of that mindset of just like, I'm not going to eat anything that has plants in it, just all of a sudden just disappeared. I, it, was, it was crazy how quickly it went away because I, I wasn't doing carnivore. It wasn't until I, you know, later I realized, holy shit, no, humans are carnivores. That's the kind of animal we are. We were taught that in elementary school. We were apex predators. Apex predators are by definition carnivores because they eat animals down the food chain. That's what an apex predator is. And that's what we are. And so I was like, holy shit. Okay, that's it. And that's what I was doing. I was living as a carnivore. I was doing that. And I came back to it. But that was it. It's it's so easy to slip off if you don't, if you don't consciously know what you're doing. And so even though I made it five years, and those were literally the five best years of my life, you know, as far as athleticism and how I felt physically, um, you know, it's, um, you know, you just sort of, you don't realize just one little chink in the armor and, and it all sort of slips away. But now I'm, I'm consciously doing this. I know exactly what I'm doing. So not really in danger of that, but I really wish I was doing this the whole time. I'm, I'm actually really pissed that I slipped off of it all. I should have been doing this my whole life. Mm -hmm. My parents should have known about this. They should have taught me this. Um, instead of me teaching them, but you know, I'm, I'm glad I, I got to anyway, and I can teach my kids, but I really wish I'd been doing this the whole time for 20 years. I would have been just a different person, just a different human being <laughs> been right? feeling a lot better for more time. It's, it's so sad thinking about the current generation of children are never mm -hmm. going to know what it's like to just be a natural human being, what it's like to feel healthy. 
hopefully yeah. unless we get unless we can get the word out and change it josh says i've got a hopefully. metal aorta valve and aortic root put in 10 years ago i've been carnivore eight months scared the cholesterol will hang around the scar tissue from the surgery should i be worried i know this is not personal advice i, I don't think so i mean i'm not a cardiothoracic surgeon but you know, I don't, I don't, uh, I don't think that cholesterol has anything to do with uh, any sort of deposition or deposits around the valves. Um, you know, the main thing with it with a metal aortic valve is you, you need to be on blood thinners, and uh, that's not going to change on a carnivore diet. Like you just, you're, you're, you have a piece of metal in your body that that's going to cause clots uh, if you if you don't take. Um, you know, your, your blood thinners for that. Uh, but no, I don't, I don't think it should cause anything else. You know, the, the, the cholesterol that you'll get is healthy cholesterol that your body is choosing to make because it needs it. It deems it necessary to make, right? You're not just going to get extra excess cholesterol, um, that your body doesn't know about and doesn't, doesn't want to use. So no, I, I think you'll be fine from that, uh, from that standpoint. I don't, I don't know of anything, um, to do with, uh, you know, aortic valve replacements that um, would be an issue anyway. All right. We've got a little two-parter here. Uh, carnivore for five months coming from keto. I was on mostly optimal weight, just looking to drop a bit of percentage body fat, but gained instead also thyroid issues. And then speaking with a functional doctor, he noted my insulin is stuck on very low body can go on reserve mode and gain fat. My insulin two thoughts. Um, well, that, your insulin too is great. You know, that, that's, that's fantastic. Body can go on reserve mode and gain fat. Uh, yeah. You know, the thing is too, is if you under eat, you can also gain fat, right? And that, that's something people, people think, oh, you, you want to eat less and then you'll, you'll lose fat or eat less fat and you'll lose fat. Uh, in fact, they can, they can actually go the other way. So, I mean, um, uh, bariatric surgeons, you, you know, even tell this or have their nutritionists say to people once they, they get this surgery, Hey, you need to eat enough. Because if you eat sort of less than a certain amount, like, you know, 1,200 uh, kilocalories for women, that uh, you'll actually put on weight. You know, you won't lose weight. So, you know, what is that? What does that mean? Well, you, you're changing yourself hormonally, but you're also, you're, you're suppressing your immune system. So you suppress your, or sorry, not your immune system, but you suppress your uh, metabolism. You also suppress your immune system if you're eating crap, but you suppress your metabolism if you're under eating, Right. And so if you're under eating, you, your body, you're telling your body that you have a lack of, of resources, that you're not able to get enough food to maintain life at a certain level and a metabolism up here. So he said, okay, can't do it. We'll bring it down here. This is like, you know, if you get your hours cut at work and you don't go on a shopping spree, you know, you start, you start, you know, cutting costs you know, trimming sales and you, you get through it, right? You start spending yourself into debt and you're screwed, right? So your body's smarter than that. It's not going to do that. And so it's going to, it's going to actually start lowering your expenditures, right? So that's lowering your metabolism. It's lowering your, your energy output. Okay. And, you know, and your body can say, okay, we need to store this stuff. We need to store this stuff, right? So it's, um, it's, it's going to do that. So you need to eat enough, but you need to eat enough meat, right? And so eat enough meat, eat enough fat, uh, your insulin being low. Um, it's supposed to be low. Like <laughs> you want it to be low. Um, you know, that that's, that's low for someone who's on a standard diet. Like, my God, what is that? That's where it's supposed to be. You know, having, having it around there is, is, is perfectly fine. So I, I wouldn't be too worried about that. You know, as I said, there are some people that can, that can gain weight, um, generally, you know, it is a hormonal issue. So thyroid, leptin, estrogen, all these other sorts of things can play a role when you have, uh, excess, uh, body tissue, body fat, it's actually metabolically active. It can actually produce estrogen. And so that can, that can play a role in weight loss as well. So, you know, you need to just let your body heal. You need to give your body time and chance. You need to give it enough. You need to give your body enough fatty meat and eat until fatty meat stops tasting good only eat meat, only drink water, give yourself enough of it and give yourself time. Your, your body takes, it's going to take a long time to heal your hormones. You know, like it's, you know, I've said before, you know, there's no shortcut. There are no shortcuts, right? You walk 10 miles into the woods, you're going to have to walk 10 miles out. 
right? So you're going to have to give your body time. It's not going to take 40 years or however long it took you to get to where you are now, but it is going to take time. So your, your hormones are going to need to heal. They're going to need to normalize. And once those get into a normal range, then you'll start seeing uh, fat loss. All right. Peter, Peter Kovacs, uh, thank you. Awesome. Uh, looks like we just got a couple more here. Jeremy M., is it normal to struggle eating bacon? Uh, yeah, if you're not hungry, right? So if bacon doesn't taste good, if a steak doesn't taste good, it means you're not hungry, right? And so, you know, if other meats are tasting good and you just really don't like bacon, okay, maybe there, there's just something about it that you don't like. But in general, if fatty meat doesn't taste good, then that's just your body telling you that you don't need to eat, that you're not hungry anymore. So um, just listen to it. You know, if you don't, if you don't aren't enjoying fatty meat, you don't have to eat for the sake of eating. In fact, your body is telling you to stop eating and just go and enjoy the rest of your day. All right. Uh, the next one was from Mockingbird. Uh, acid reflux due to mechanical issue of the valve not closing properly. Any advice or do's and don'ts on carnivore diet? Um, acid reflux due to a mechanical issue. Okay, so... Um, well, carnivore is not, not necessarily going to, going to affect that. Um, but what carnivore can do is uh, it has been known to reduce reflux symptoms and, and can improve the acidity of your stomach so you're not getting um, overly acidic uh, stomach acid and, and, um, and causing problems that way. Um, it just depends. It just depends on, on the, the anatomical issue that you have um, and, and whether or not that's that's going to help with a carnivore diet. Quite often, uh, what we're eating has a, has a big role to play in the carnivore diet, but um, I, I don't know because I don't know exactly what your, your anatomical uh, disruption is. Sometimes people have uh, neurological issues. Um, you know, we don't go through normal peristalsis or these or other sort of things. Those things um, could potentially heal. But it, it just depends on the individual again. So uh, yeah, it's no no necessary not necessarily any do's and don'ts apart from just avoid spices and carbs and just anything. Just eat meat. Just drink water. And um, you know if and, and then you can also do a a, a, di a diary so you can see how much you're eating. So if you're eating a lot, does that cause a problem? If you're not eating all that much, does that cause a problem, or is that is that better? So. Track what you're eating, track what your symptoms are, see how they line up, see if there's anything that you can can adjust and manage to improve it. And um, that's actually a lot more helpful than than uh, than uh, people give credit for. So you know, people are having little problems like that. You know, keeping track of it and and monitoring it with like a sort of calendar. At this time, I did this. Then I had these symptoms, all these sorts of things. You can start seeing patterns, or you can just look at like it's completely unrelated. Just you know, get on with it. All right, Mama Bear, 17-year-old son, partial agenesis, corpus callosum, epilepsy, severe cognitive delay, been high fat, 98% carnivore for three years. Any chance the corpus callosum will develop more? Um, no, I don't think so, unfortunately. Um, you know, his, his um, you know, he, he, might, he might improve symptomatically in some ways. But you know, no, I, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't think that those major structures are necessarily going to uh, to to regrow. You know, at seventeen, you know, your brain, your brain is still growing. Your brain is always remodeling and can improve at any age. But at you know, at seventeen, it's really done. You know, the majority of its of its development, unfortunately, most I mean, really most of that's done in utero for those sorts of things with like corpus callosum, as well. However, epilepsy, uh, yes, that can that can certainly help, um, and at least you know raise the threshold and sometimes make it so he's not having you know breakthrough seizures on medications or maybe not doesn't require as many medications, and you know the the longer he goes without seizures the the less likely he is to have more seizures which is very good uh, so i'm very sorry about that that's that's a very difficult situation i do think it would still help in a lot of ways just just making him healthier overall um i don't, I don't think it's going to regrow his, his corpus callosum though unfortunately but 
it could help him in other ways. And, and I think it could help the epilepsy and, um, you know, could help, you know, him, him be a bit, uh, a, you know, develop a bit better from here forward. Unfortunately, it's, it can't undo, um, everything though, unfortunately, but, uh, but I do think it will still make him better, you know, better than, you know, better than he would be otherwise, you know, the thing is eating a lot of carbohydrates and things like that and not letting his brain run on ketones, it's, it's going to curtail, um, you know, his brain function, you know, so wherever his brain function is at, it's going to make it less run worse. And so being on a carnivore diet, being on a ketogenic diet, having high ketones, allowing your brain to run on its optimal fuel source, it's going to give his brain its, its maximal potential for, um, you know, for, for you, you know, utility, right? So, you know, whatever his brain can do, you know, it's going to be able to do that. And, you know, that's all we can really hope for sometimes. All right. Uh, you guys are just awesome. Can't wait for the film. The rest of the world needs to hear this. Yeah. If anyone wants to participate, the links below carnivore uh, diet movie.com. And then we have, I was going to say, we have one more. There's one more that just popped in there. Nitrates bad in bacon. I have found nitrate free bacon, but it's, uh, it's in every processed meat here in Germany. Mm. Well, the thing is too, with, with nitrate free, uh, bacon or anything, um, and, uh, you know, they, 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 you'll look in there and it'll say like, you know, you know, celery powder or something like that. The reason there's celery powder in there is because there are more nitrates in celery than there is in bacon, right? So they put like this celery powder in there. There's just tons and tons and tons of nitrates in there. Uh, another thing is too, that, you know, something that Dr. Barry uh, pointed out, you make, you, you produce more nitrates in your saliva than you'll get in bacon. Right. And a lot of these studies looking at, at uh, nitrates and nitrites and things like that, they were using doses that were way, way, way above anything you're going to find in, um, you know, processed meats and things like that, like hundreds of times more, thousands of times more. Right. And we have hundreds of times more just in our saliva. So, you know, some, something that someone said today, they thought that it might be something to do with, you know, the nitrates and then how they process them. And this, I think, I don't know. I've never heard that before. Uh, but if you're just talking about if it's the same, you know, stuff that's coming in our saliva, we have more of that in our saliva than in there. And you're, you know, if you find uh, nitrate free bacon, um, you know, it, it, you, you look out for the celery powder because that, that has more nitrates in it. Now, you can you can sometimes get naturally cured stuff and it doesn't have that sort of stuff. But, yeah, it is difficult to find. The solution to that is just get pork bellies and just and just cook that yourself. You know, it doesn't have that smoky, nice, salty flavor of bacon, but it's still pretty damn good. And uh, and it's not going to have any of that that other added stuff that you don't want if you don't want it, if you're worried about it. Yeah. Emma and I did that about a month ago. We smoked up a pork belly. It was delicious. Put a little salt on it at the oh, end. Oh, nice. Uh, yeah. Doc C is my guy. He's got muscles in his feet because he eats nothing but meat. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> okay here's the last one unless another one pops in here real quick my dad is 75 has pains in his legs for the past 10 years 10 years or so pains in his back for most of his life should he cut all grains bread and cereals yeah hard yes yeah definitely um you know it can it can significantly help with pain um and you know and, and also just w with cognition and longevity Right. So 75 years old, that's middle aged. Right. Does he feel middle aged? I'm middle aged. I don't feel middle aged. I feel like I'm 20. I feel like at, at 43, I feel like I'm 23. I feel better at 43 than I did at 27. Right. Because I feel like I did when I was 23, because I was, my body's working the same way it did when I was 23. And so, except I know a lot more stuff now and I have more money. So that's good. And, um, but, uh, you know, the, the thing is, is that this, this is really, really significant, especially for people in extremes of age. So kids, when they're developing their, their brains and their bodies are developing, this is really important for them to be on proper nutrition. Also in extremes of age, when you're getting, you know, later on in life, this is very, very important. You need proper nutrition. You need to avoid all those other things because it's, um, harmful and you, and you don't have the same threshold and um you know, re you know resilience that you did in your your sort of your 20s but that doesn't matter because if you eat properly if you eat what your body's designed to eat then your body works properly you don't you don't need to 
you don't need to like push through and just, you know, struggle along. Just don't eat crap. Just eat fatty meat, only drink water and you'll be fine. His pain will improve dramatically. He'll put on muscle. His brain will start working better. He'll, his cognition will improve. His brain fog will go away. His sleep will improve. His energy will improve. He'll start being able to exercise more, which will then stimulate his brain even further and feel even better after that. So, you know, this is something that that I think is vitally important for all of us to get our, you know, friends and relatives at all on this. But you know, especially ones that are that are getting older, uh, have health issues, or people that have you know kids, you know, because this this, this is going to help them. Uh, more than anybody and uh, just more and more people that we can get on this and showing them showing everybody around them Wow, look how great this is. Maybe I'll try it. They do really well. Someone else sees that. Wow, that's really great Maybe I'll try it. This is how this spreads and that's how this has been spreading for the last 20 years, right? And uh, it's been very so you haven't heard about it until right now because it's only just starting to catch um, that exponential growth when people are just more and more people and more and more people are hearing about it or talking about it, making channels like this. And then that's inspiring other people to, to make other channels and other channels and other channels. And that's where we're at now. So yes, a hundred percent. I think you should definitely cut out all breads and cereals and all that sort of carbs and sugar and all that stuff. And then get rid of the rest of the plants after that. And certainly alcohol as well. And just go just meat and water. And if he, if he can't do that, just a lot of fatty meat, no carbs, no sugar, nothing artificial. Um, you know, get rid of seed, you know, beans, seeds, legumes, and all that sort of stuff. And just have, you know, some salads with a lot of fatty meat. Don't do spinach every night. Spinach has buttloads of, of oxalates. You can deal with about 150 milligrams of oxalates a day. Half a cup of spinach has over 600 oxalate, uh, milligrams of oxalates, right? So we say, oh, well, are these things in the, in, you know, in the proportions and in, in, in the foods that we're eating? Yes, damn it, they are, and more so, you know? So, um, you know, I mean, I used to make spinach salads that were like, you know, half a pound of, of spinach leaves, you know? And, and like, you know, like a whole chicken and things like that. I mean, Jesus, like, what the hell was that doing to me? You know, so... You know, no, you don't, you don't want to eat any of that crap, but you know, um, you know, see what you can do with them. Definitely get them eating a lot more and get them off all carbs, get them into a state of ketosis. So his brain works better and his body works better. Get him carnivore if you can and life will be good. Yeah. I just interviewed a man, 78 went carnivore, just thriving. All these issues Pat mentioned, mm -hmm. he's reversed. He's just, he's killing it. He feels so good. Charm mom, uh, new South. Wales, Australia. Hello. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And then the last one, we got to the bottom. Sherry Q, $1. <laughs> thank you so much. Wow. That nice. was a lot. Well, thank you. That was a little longer one, right, <laughs> Dr. Chafee? Three that was, that was, yeah, that was long. That was definitely a longer one. There's still almost 1,100 people here. Thank you so much, Dr. Goodness. Chafee. This has been great. You, uh, you no should problem. go eat a thank steak you. now and get some sleep or something. Yeah, well, it's like it's pushing 2 a.m., so I should oh, probably man. do that. And, yeah, yeah I, haven't, I haven't eaten yet, but that's fine. I, I still I, I still feel the same. It's all good. Awesome. Yeah, I, I hate to not do the super chats, and, and I, we've never had this many before. They just yeah. kept coming in. It's like hard to keep up with them, but this has been wonderful. Thank you so much. Again, anyone here yeah. from my channel, I highly encourage you to go check out Dr. Anthony Chafee's channel. It's awesome what you're doing, and your podcast is great, too. Yeah. Well, and then everyone on my channel, go check out uh, Homestead How. It's awesome. So you know, a lot of homesteading uh, videos and uh, as well as new carnivore sort of stuff. And, you know, Carrie and his family have been uh, new carnivores and they're having like amazing, amazing results. So it's very inspirational uh, to anyone who um, who's, you know, you know, interested in the carnivore uh, lifestyle or, or interested in, in people that are you know, or still sort of thinking about it, saying, OK, well, what are sort of the effects and benefits that people are having this is, is a real life example of someone, you know, who started out with it and, you know, chronicled their, their progression and improvement and has had amazing results. So you can see what your future looks like. Check it out. Uh, check out his stuff. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Have a good day. Thanks everyone. Great to see everyone. Thank you so much. And thanks Homesick Buck. I appreciate it for the movie. All right. Bye everyone. Yeah. Thank you, sir.